pleasure today uh, to guide you throughout the agenda of this very rich uh, event. Uh, as you know, uh, we will dedicate uh, presentations and discussions to the topic of IoT and edge computing. This is the second workshop of a series. And today we will, today and tomorrow actually, uh, from 9.30 to 12.30, we will concentrate on specific topics, the far edge. Uh, obviously, I'm not alone. Uh, besides uh, several uh, of you in the audience, we have uh, uh, top speakers that today will uh, share with us uh, their learnings, their view, their experience. And we will try to make also uh, some interactive sessions to ensure that we can voice also uh, the audience and some of your most pressing questions. Uh, now, uh, let me... Um, anticipate a few rules. So first of all, this session will be entirely recorded and published on the NGIOT channel. So if you are not comfortable, I'm afraid you will have to leave the room. All participants except the speakers and moderators will be muted by default. And if you are not a speaker, please mute, turn off your video. Uh, you can uh, post questions and input and comments on the Zoom chat, of course. And if you'd like to speak when we have dedicated session, please raise your hand. There is a little icon, you can do that. And finally, if you have any technical question at some point along the course of action, uh, feel free to um, contact info at ngiot.eu. Uh, but now let us enter into the, the discussion day. So first of all, this uh, workshop has been organized in collaboration uh, with uh, NGIOT, Artemis uh, in the, in Industry Association, the AIOTI and the European Connect the Commission, in particular DigiConnect. So I'm not alone, I'm in very good company, as you will see in a second. And uh, we will start with um, some key takeaways from the first webinar we had on IoT and edge computing, but also on forward-looking perspective on uh, future directions for Europe on the, uh, in the area of IoT and edge computing. We will have Max Lemke from the European Commission, Jean-Luc Di Paola Galloni from Artemis uh, IA, and Martin Brinska from NGIoT Aarhus University. So uh, now I suggest we take it from here and I give the floor to Max, then Jean-Luc will take uh, the floor and finally Martin uh, to then uh, move forward. Uh, Max, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Monique. Thank you very much. I would need to share my screen and I cannot do because you have to go out Yeah, Monique, first. you should please stop sharing your screen and then Max can do it. Oh, okay, so let me just share. Yeah, it's working. And now you get, you should see the, you don't see the slideshow yet, no? Not yet, no. Now, now. yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome to everybody here on, on behalf of the commission. <laughs> what I would like to do is just give you a bit of a scene setting. So we are at the end of a programming period, you all know that. All the projects have now been selected and also in the joint undertaking. I don't know whether everything is already out, but I mean, we are in the final phase of the, the programming period uh, with Horizon 2020. The work programs for the new one are also in the final stage, but I would say there are still some adjustments that can be made. Uh, and also the budget question is the budgets, we are fixing them now, but we always fix them under the assumption that the heads of states can agree, probably this week, on the budget and that they fight their political battles. So, so that's, that's totally out of our control. We hope it will go fine. And then I would expect that we have calls open in spring in early spring, I would, I, I would say. I'm very happy to see here Artemisia, IoT, also Eclipse here in these two days, because I think these, these are the key uh, associations and organizations here who have a say in, 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 the, in this topic. So Artemisia, IoT, but then also for, for open source environments, Eclipse. So I think this is quite important. And I think this is good that, that you are together and that we do not tackle everything separately. Now, if I give you a view on how I see cloud and edge at the moment, 
I give you this picture of the far edge, that's the devices, that's the IoT, the devices get smarter and smarter and they will have more and more computing power coming. Edge is in the middle and that's a bit, bit I call it edge, cloud, cloud edge, that's somewhat in between, that could as well be a network, an ad hoc network via 5G where some resources are brought together. So that's a bit of fluent thing in the middle and on the right hand side we see the cloud in general. So when I see how, how different groups of organizations, industry address this, when I look at the hyperscalers, they look from the right, they would like to get everything in the cloud. So, and when they talk about edge, in most cases, they mean what I call here edge cloud. I don't think they go into the far edge yet. And I'm, I'm sure they will at some point, but they are not. And when you look at Gaia X, for example, the uh, Franco German, now European initiatives, I would also say they, they go into the middle, but I don't think they go very far into the left. Now, when I see at you, when, when I see us from the Internet of Things, from the embedded systems, from the cyber physical system side, we are always looking at the edge, but sometimes in our control systems, these far edge systems do not have a lot of computing power, but I see that that is increasing and increasing. So I would say for us, edge is from the far edge, from the left to the middle. And that is also where I see the European opportunity, because that's where our strength is. Now, there are many use cases that underpin this trend to the edge. I mean, you have seen our commissioner is often promoting that at the moment, 80% of computing is done centralized in the cloud, 20% at the edge in smart connected objects. In five years, it will be the opposite. And when you look at some use cases, you see that really happening. When you look at health and well-being, you, you could really do the processing of a person and his, his health at home rather than sending all the data to the cloud. So, so you would not only protect his privacy, but you would also save energy because you don't have to send huge amounts of data around. And that way, you, that way, I think in health and in other sectors, we can contribute to the Green Deal by reducing the carbon footprint, by having less energy co consumption, by not sending everything around. So the more computing power we have at the edge, the more we can do that. And there are many other examples like, like in, in agriculture and in automotive and in industry 4.0, where in particular also real time aspects come in and the Artemis, the Artemisia colleagues here uh, know that, know that extremely, know these cases extremely well. But I think in top, on top of real time aspects, privacy, security, energy, environmental aspects speak for more computing power at the edge. Now, this, you don't have to read the full slide. The conclusion for me from this slide is just, the further you get to the left on my slide, from cloud to edge cloud to far edge, the, the more you see European actors, the more you see opportunities for European actors. If I draw this picture for the cloud for the right-hand side, you will see rare European actors. If you go to the left, on this picture, I think you see a lot of European actors. So Europe has a chance, but how can you go and have a chance vis-a-vis -vis very large actors like the hyperscalers? You have to join forces. So what I'm promoting here strongly is we on a European scale, again, have to join forces because the, the, sum, of many, the sum of many small can only become large if we get kind of an operating system, how the small work together. And when I look at that, for the far edge, we will go towards ubiquitous decentralization. I would even say the commissioner, we have discussed with the commissioner recently, that's going towards in the long medium to long term towards swarm computing, where we get intelligence at the edge, where we see architectural challenges, like we, we, we have to glue between the cloud and the control systems that we have at the moment. We get swarm intelligence, that means distributed reasoning, context awareness, obviously, and, and it's a decentralization of not only of computing, but also intelligence. And we have to look into new operating systems or meta, meta operating 
system approaches at the far edge to get all the things together to be able to introduce things like swarm computing and also to orchestrate between the far edge and the edge, which includes device integration at system or system of system level. And at the edge nodes itself, we need to build on progress in low energy, integrate AI, machine learning, and we need programming environments. And I know we have projects going in that direction, but I think we need to get our act more together in integrating that also towards getting platforms in this direction. So to finalize, to close, far edge computing and smart IoT, I see a window of opportunity for Europe for gaining ground in computing. Yeah, so I see this opportunity, but the window of opportunity is very small. So we have to build on European strength at the far edge and in applications. We have to take stock on where we stand because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Let's get from there. And I see when I look at your strategic research agenda, the one, the draft one I've seen from, from, from electronic components and systems, but also the ones of IoT, Nessie and others, we have to see where we are, what we have. I think we are aligned to some extent on where we want to go. The window of opportunity is small. What is needed in the short and medium term is research, innovation, deployment. But look at it carefully, research, innovation, deployment. And I think it goes across in the new programming cycle. It, this cuts across several programs. So I'm asking you not just looking at the long-term research, but I ask you also, what do we have? What can we start deploying now? Should we connect our constituencies and visions more than we are already doing? I know uh, there's Artemisia, there's IoT, there's Nessie uh, as well. There are some thoughts in the direction of cloud and applications also in, the, in Gaia X. We see that the 5G PPP is thinking more about applications than before. We also see the strategic research agenda of high peak from the more academic side or from the, from, let's say from the academic leaders in computing or all academic leaders in computing that we have in Europe. So who are the European actors needed to lead and to progress horizontally across the different verticals, across the sectors, but also instantiation, customization ver vertically. And there we also look clearly for the champions who are driving that process. So this is what I would like to give you as food for thought for these two days. And I hope that you have uh, food for two days and help us uh, bringing our research and innovation agendas forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Max. Now I give the floor to Jean-Luc because we have uh, quite uh, short slots. I'm sorry about that. Please, Jean-Luc, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman. Very nice uh, to meet with you all. Uh, nice to see Max and uh, listening carefully to his uh, very interesting presentation to, uh, I would say, set the scene. Uh, also from my side, I'm a bit of a scene setter. Uh, I remain for the ones I don't know and our web viewers that I am um, the current president of Artemis IA and also a chair of the private members board of the current Excel in the preparation of the next uh, KDT. Uh, what I want to remind is that already Artemis uh, Industry Association has already published a report last year on the importance of embedded intelligence. And this paved the way of the topic today on uh, IoT and systems of systems. And uh, those trends and challenges uh, were really already uh, pre-analyzed in a, I would say, helicopter view in that report to which uh, Max was very kindly um, assisting last year in uh, uh, March 2019. But this year, it's my pleasure also to um, mention that one of our distinguished um, contributor to this two-day session, Paolo Azzoni from Eurotech, has uh, coordinated an, a, a very interesting work on Internet of Things and Systems of Systems as 
putting this paper as one of the themes of our strategic research agenda of Artemis and to put it in the digital scope. Uh, we believe in Artemis EA that IoT and SOS represent a crucial technology, an enabler for the digitalization and for European digital agenda. And particularly Internet of Things has become a real, uh, I would say, uh, a reality uh, thanks to many series of enablers that are part of the ECS value chain. And uh, IoT and SOS represent, for sure, uh, one of the biggest uh, sub-chain of this value chain. First, the coverage of ECS value chain is spending on its higher parts, where the value is expected to have a tenfold growth. I think it's high time in Europe that we check where the growth in high parts uh, is. And indeed, this is a, a very crucial impact. Second, I think that in our community and in the community as a broader view of Excel, we, we have all the stakeholders to cover the different roles that are required in this value chain uh, covering IoT and system of system. <clears throat> this means that we have the, I would say, the different technologies, the business models, the managerial skills and the operational rules to create these IoT solutions to go into a global market. And still, uh, there are some obstacles that we need to remove and, and challenges that we need to face. And these are, for example, safety, uh, trust, uh, reliability, availability of so-called open platforms, but also the interoperability and some engineering support. And I think that when we look at the trends, uh, the assessment of the achievements and the investment of previous projects, uh, particularly that we had in what I know uh, in Excel, allows to clarify where we must invest in research and innovation and where we need to remove the barriers and provide solutions that will speed up this IoT uptake. So I was very sensitive that uh, Max has very much wanted uh, these two days in order to really show uh, this importance and we will welcome any action that will complement uh, the one that already KDT uh, will seem to cover. And I would like to say that particularly under these terrible pandemic times, uh, for sure, uh, there will be many shifts, unavoidable changes in our economy and society. And that the Internet of Things and the system of system will certainly have an accelerated importance on those and that they will require valid research, valid implementation, and strong control. Europe has here an opportunity to seize those valid research, implementation, and control. So we really need to move forward and to bring on table a substantial pillar with this thematic. And it is part also of our better level of autonomy for our continent, if not of sovereignty. So it will bring an essential brick to consider uh, the future of our digitalization. And it will support from the very first pillars from the semiconductors innovation as a standalone, but also all the ECS approach as a true ecosystem. So we really need to work on that. It is of the highest importance of strategic market value for now and for our future in Europe. So again, I want to thank all the organizers to have done uh, the, these two days to prepare and to let speak the experts. Uh, we are in Artemis IA, a very open, I would say, technology platform, more than an association. And I'm very 
honored that I was asked to open these uh, two days. I will let, and I'm very happy that uh, with uh, Patrick Pieper, Paolo Azzoni and others, we will cover with valid experts uh, what Artemisia can bring uh, in the pot. I welcome uh, future alliances and uh, I would say uh, constructive alliances with the other stakeholders that we may find here in Europe. And this will lead us to certainly a more constructive, uh, I would say, future around this very important uh, uh, and not even emerging, but clearly emerged a theme of the digital where we need to, to be very strong around all together. So I stop here and I thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Uh, I give the floor now to Max, uh, to Martin, sorry, because we need to speed up a little bit. Sorry sure. about that. Sure. Martin, you, the Monique. floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and uh, Max, Jean-Luc, it's a pleasure to open uh, this session together with you. Uh, also, just to echo, yeah, the far edge, it's here. It's something we have to reflect on now. Um, so my name is Martin Brunskau. I'm uh, the coordinator uh, of the NGIOT. Uh, um, coordination support action which is actually meant to bring the communities together to bring the different uh, um, strategic research uh, innovation and deployment agendas um, strongly together so we're very happy here today to see um, also Artemisia joining us and um, the Eclipse Foundation many more. Um, so Max, yes, uh, this is clearly about decentralization, computing in context, but I would say also it's about catering for a diversity. So it is actually also to ensure that the technology, uh, the infrastructures that we're putting out in our societies to support the uh, societal challenges, whether they are around the green, around the economy, around the social, that the technology actually supports that. Uh, I'm also um, the chair of uh, the Open Agile Smart Cities and Communities uh, Network of Networks. So you see systems of systems, network of networks, there's a logic here. So how do we actually cater for what people, what communities, what we as Europe need? That is the fundamental challenge here. So today we will focus a little bit more on the longer term and tomorrow we will zoom in and uh, look at the short to midterm mobilization. Yes, uh, Jean-Luc, I agree, interoperability is certainly an issue, but also how we don't connect everything with everyone, right? Because that is also introducing vulnerability, as we know very much here in the COVID-19 age. So what are the prioritized short and midterm um, um, actions we really need. You mentioned, Max, that the program's almost done. We will zoom into that tomorrow. Today, we will really look about, so what is it that is not really there yet? What the market cannot, together with the communities, just sit down and get done. So that's the mobilization. That's the decentralized, but still together uh, actions we need to do, even today for the longer term. So very happy to be here with you and Monique, thank you for taking us through the day. I'm looking forward also to uh, seeing the continuity from the uh, previous uh, sessions we've had uh, the, the previous months and we will continue in the coming months to drive this mobilization off the network. So shall we, we will certainly uh, bring together our vision. Thank you very much. All of us, it's good to see a full room as it were and uh, hope to see you tomorrow as well. Talk later today. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Now we go ahead. I hope you can see my screen um, <clears throat> with Paola Azzoni from Eurotech um, that in particular will um, tell us uh, about the Artemis white paper that Jean-Luc mentioned from the Internet of Things to System of, to system of Systems. I give immediately the floor to uh, Paolo. Paolo, you can... Uh, Yes, good morning everybody. I'm, I'm just morning. start sharing the screen. You should now see it. Let Perfect. See you can, can see it well. Now you sh should see the presentation. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good morning everybody and welcome also from my side uh, and thanks for the invitation to this workshop. Uh, I'm Paola Sun, I'm from Eurotech, uh, formerly a company of Leonardo Group. And today I will try to, to uh, 
uh, help in setting up the scene, presenting the, the key findings of this uh, study that we have done this year, and that has been published in, in, in April. It's important to study IoT and system of system, and I remember you that IoT is just uh, in, my, in my mind a small instance of system of system. Uh, IoT play a fundamental role in European digital age because IoT is considered the backbone of digitalization with a huge market. We are expecting 3 trillion of euro and 30 billion of connected devices in three, five years, more or less. IoT then is also a solution to improve the aggregate efficiency. It is a factor of the economic growth that uh, can be affected by uh, IoT in terms of productivity, fault resilience, fault tolerance, uh, supply chain optimization, etc. IoT is also fundamental today to accelerate the economic recovery after COVID and in particular to exploit uh, the, the opportunity that COVID will offer and is already offering IoT, it's important for the Artemis Industrial Association, is one of the six focus areas and uh, covers a large part of the electronic component and system value chain. So this study, it's important for us because it's, it aims at providing a snapshot of the IoT market, identify the achievement uh, and the position of Artemis and Excel in the international panorama. We started in 2018 and considered 107 Artemis and Excel projects in, in the last decade. Um, Jean-Luc mentioned before, uh, anticipated this, this important concept of key enablers. Um, first of all, the, the cost of IoT, of IoT electronic components that has been steadily decreasing since 2004 uh, at a rate of more than 40%. Then there is computing power that Max already anticipated. It, it, this represented for a long time a limitation for IoT, but today computing power is available on all the nodes of the IoT infrastructure. And it, it, enable the, the, it enables the processing of information on site and specifically only when it is required. So it, it's, a stream, it's a very optimized approach. Then IoT need for its for its inherent nature, a global hyperconnectivity, because we have to transfer a huge quantity of collected information. Edge computing can help in reducing the traffic, but connectivity remains uh, a critical aspect. We have also to reduce the price of connectivity because this was another historical barrier for IoT. And uh, then there is another enabler is important. Uh, it's the introduction of the concept of everything as a service that is um, important because it, it, it ensures uh, business flexibility and the availability in time of the service. Today, we have also the existence of complete value chains because uh, if we consider, this is important because if we consider the IoT multidisciplinarity, a winning IoT solution can be developed only when all the stakeholders involved in the value chain cooperate to develop the solution. And this cooperated today is also supported by new business models that are capable to unleash uh, the real potential of IoT. And finally, uh, Max uh, at the beginning mentioned it, uh, European programs that are conceived to accelerate the, digi the digitalization and maximize the impact of the research and of digital technologies in Europe. The study provides uh, a snapshot of the IoT market uh, uh, in, in 2020 with an estimation of, it, of its evolution towards 2025. Um, the global market, the global IoT market was valued at $190 billion in 2018 and is projected to reach $1.1 trillion by 2025 uh, with 25 billion of devices, two zettabytes of data. That is huge opportunities, huge number, huge opportunities, huge risks, and also a huge impact. Asia and Pacific are expected to drive the growth, uh, followed by North America and Europe. And if we consider the value chain, uh, the expected revenue share for platform services and application confirms the shift of the value uh, in the value chain downward. And this part of the value chain is expected to grow 10 times 
in the next five years. Uh, if we consider the vertical application, manufacturing is expected to totalize the largest impact, but again, also the other market present huge opportunities. We can say that today everything is digital is accelerating, especially due to the pandemics. But uh, there are specific uh, uh, trends that are interwined that are shaping the evolution of IoT. For example, computing on the edge. Uh, IDC estimates that already by 2022, 40% of all data created by IoT will be stored, processed, and analyzed at the edge or very close to the edge. And this is an important number. Then there is artificial intelligence that is becoming available to a large set of embedded systems, also on the far edge. Uh, what we call edge AI is one of the faster growing trends in the AI domain. Then regarding IP connectivity, a large part of the telecom operator are already start cooperating with IoT platform provider to develop global connectivity platform because these ensure high performances and seamless connectivity. And obviously 5G in this context is really in the spotlight. Uh, there are great expectations from 5G. Then there is trustworthiness that is crucial for, for the evolution of, of IoT and uh, must be perceived more as an opportunity uh, than a burden. Um, there is also a new awareness for sustainability that is leading a, a large, co large cooperation to reprioritize their top level strategy in the, in the interest of sustainability and Green Deal. And finally, the life cycle. IoT is forcing to reconsider the concept of life cycle that fr very frequently we, in our mind, is only related to the phase of engineering but that must be extended also to operations, maintenance, to retirement of the product, recycling and the evolution. The study identifies six macroscopic research streams in the project that we have analyzed. They haven't a strict chronological order, but they can mix, merge, sometimes they run independently following the maturity level of the technology and also of the community that are developing this project. For example, enabling technologies that lay down the foundation of IoT, evaluating the technologies that are in a very early stage of development and create new ideas. Then we have architecture that allows to integrate different technologies in a more complex, uh, in a more, with, a, with a wider perspective and in a rational and harmonized way. Then platforms that are the core of the IoT, of an IoT end-to-end -end solution, they typically implement an architecture. Engineering support it is fundamental uh, to design, develop, and operate these new products across their entire life cycle. And then we have two transversal uh, research streams, one focused on interoperability, this is a key element to control uh, the IoT intrinsic diversity and avoid market fragmentation and trust because it's fundamental to ensure security, safety, integrity, privacy, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the massive transformation that IoT is generating. The study identified several project lines in this decade, indicated that um, there is a wider vision that extends beyond single project boundaries and uh, it demonstrates also the continuity of research, of research across technologies, consortia, and also calls for proposal. And uh, we analyze also the, the, the IoT value chain in terms of stakeholders, in terms of their role, in terms of the integration level of the value chain and, and its evolution. And the research activities demonstrating to completely cover the IoT value chain here you can see some example of projects that have been developed or are still ongoing. And, um, and this is a key factor because we want to deliver end-to-end -end solutions and we have to cover the entire value chain to do this. And finally, the investments. It's really important to invest in IoT because uh, there are many motivations, technical, societal, uh, economical, I remember you, I said twice that the IoT value chain is expected to grow from two to 10 times by 2025. These are huge numbers. 
huge opportunities. In the last 10 years, uh, two thirds of the total investments in our time is Excel have been devoted to IoT related projects and one third to IoT specific technologies. So again, huge investments. And this is an underestimation because uh, for coherence between Artemis and Excel, we did not consider the Excel project that were focused on semiconductor process technology, equipments, materials, etc. But this project for sure have an impact on IoT. In conclusion, uh, IoT is no more in hype, it's consolidated, but we have some major challenges uh, that must be tackled to meet the societal needs and the market demand. First of all, we have to fill the lack of trust in IoT technologies. We have to ensure an adequate level of interoperability and reduce fragmentation. Here, we have to find the right trade-off between confidentiality and privacy and the level of openness that is required by IoT value chain to flourish beyond brands, industries, technologies, standards, and also vertical domain boundaries. We have to develop open IoT platforms that are, must be more ubiquitous with hyperconnectivities, more pervasive with miniaturized and low power uh, physical nodes, more autonomous with embedded intelligence, more light and sustainable uh, through the edge computing, and or more open to cross-brand and uh, cross-domain interoperability. IoT products then require engineering support more than other products uh, for the entire life cycle, and this is due to their nature. And finally, as already anticipated by many of, the, uh, of, uh, of us, uh, define a pan-European strategy to bundle forces and develop a solid uh, IoT ecosystem that is ca really capable to support IoT and system of system innovation and market development. And here you, I, I have some links that I put in the presentation to, to the study that we have recently published during the last two years. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, sorry to cut in, but we have a little bit of a time pressure. Uh, the um, link um, has been shared with, uh, with all participants on the chat. Uh, Zoom chat for the paper and the slides will be made available. So Thank now you. I would like to um, ask you to stop sharing your screen, uh, Paolo, because we have yes. to, uh, we will give the, the screen and the control uh, to Kern de Bochelle ah, from KU Leuven and that will uh, now, Kern, here we are. I don't know if I... Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if I pronounce your uh, family name correctly. I'm sorry. I will do it myself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So my name is Kuno Bostre. I'm the IP coordinator, but not from KU Leuven, but from Ghent University, but that's fine. It's also in Belgium. Um, thanks for inviting me uh, to this event. And I decided to talk about sustainability. It has already been mentioned a couple of times before, but there are, uh, at this moment we are working on the Hypix vision, which is our biannual as array, uh, so to speak. And there is a major part of this is about sustainability of computing. And I would like to share a few insights uh, with this community today. Many of you know this uh, image by Cisco, uh, uh, projecting uh, 50 billion uh, IoT devices or Internet of Things devices uh, this year. In reality, they are, the numbers are lower, and the previous slides I saw, they are even lower than what is, uh, was mentioned here in the previous um, workshop. But still, this is an increase of 20% per year. And uh, another person, my uh, Yoshi son, who uh, bought ARM, predicted in 2016 that 20 years later, that's 2036, there would be one trillion connected devices. Now, whether it's 36 or 40 or 46 or 50, it's not that important, but maybe it's important to just think a little bit of what one trillion actually means. Huh? Imagine that we have an old fashioned telephone directory like this one, I'm sure most of you know this, and we have 100, and we want to make a directory of all the IoT devices, one trillion IoT devices, and we have 125 per column. And we have four columns per page and two pages per sheet. And that means that we can put 1,000 devices per sheet. But then if you have one trillion, you still have one billion sheets. So that's, with that uh, amount of paper, you can fill the area of Manhattan. Or if you make them into a book, you have a book of 100 kilometers thick. Hmm? 
So what does it mean, 100 kilometer? Well, this is the atmosphere. We go up to the thermosphere, which is at 100 kilometer, and you have a very thick book. So if you fly with a plane here, and you meet the book somewhere uh, on, on, on your journey, if you say, well, now we are 10%, but the pile is 10 times higher. That's one trillion. That's huge. And that has serious consequences for sustainability. So we make a distinction between human scale and Terra scale. So I think today we are still in human scale, but once we go to these numbers, this is not human scale anymore, this is beyond human scale. One trillion means that by that time, maybe there will be 10 billion people on the planet. That means 100 devices per person. If you think about it, everybody has pens at home. I have a family of three here now. I do not have 300 pens at home. So that means that there will be more IoT devices around people than they have access to pens. That's what this means. So maybe that can mean two things. I don't know what, can you hear me? Yes, everything all right. Okay. Yes, so yes. That's, that means that I think the, the, they will be as common as pants. Hmm? Um, so this is a very interesting uh, talk by Albert Allen Bartlett, who said, well, the greatest shortcoming of human race is our inability to understand exponential function. I think we all realize this after the COVID um, uh, pandemic, no, during the COVID pandemic now that uh, exponential growth is something very uh, special. So if you have time, I would definitely uh, encourage you to watch this movie. Uh, he died several years ago, but it's still interesting to see how he thinks about exponential um, processes. Just think about the power. So all these devices are electric devices. They will have standby power. If they only have one megawatt of standby, the standby power times one trillion, that's one gigawatt. So for every one milliwatt of standby power, we need an extra nuclear power plant or the equivalent of a uh, nuclear power plant. That's only one mega, uh, milliwatt. If you look at standby power, standby power of common uh, devices that we have in our uh, homes, like just a charger for a smartphone in sockets, without the smartphone connected, consumes 20 milliwatts. A notebook which is switched off to by surprise, switched off, still consumes 470 milliwatts. So if you start multiplying this by the billions, that's really something. So if you think that per year we're going to add, for instance, 5 billion new IoT devices, if they only consume 1 milliwatt, that's 5 gigawatts of power that you add. Of course, you can it might be that, or hopefully, the IoT device will also um, deliver some reductions in power in the process. And that can offset this, but just the share, um, the, the, just the amount of power that will be needed by these devices is huge. So that's sustainability-wise is an important aspect. Think about the smart bulb. The smart bulb, when not uh, on, consumes 150 milliwatts. So if you would decide to change all the bulbs in the world by smart bulbs, this is not going to work. Then there's also uh, recycling of the electronics. So there was an article in 2018 in um, ITP Spectrum um, about the Internet of Trash, which is also abbreviated as IoT. And there is say, well, of course, the uh, e-waste, the amount of e-waste is, is growing uh, globally. And what we are doing now is we are adding semiconductors to products that previously had none. And also the lifetime of these devices are getting shorter by just adding electronics that uh, get older um, faster. So, and that's also an issue, of course. For instance, if you look at these two light switches, the right one is a mechanical one. It costs 1.37 uh, euros a piece. And this one is a digital one, uh, contains a PCB and, and, and of course electronics. So it's not only more expensive, but also the life. So this can run for 50, 60, maybe 100 years. I know life switches that are almost 100 years old in, in houses. This one will never last that long. This one can easily be recycled, take away the plastic and the rest is metal. You can recycle it. This contains a PCB and all kinds of uh, advanced uh, devices. This is interesting. This is the table of Mendeleev. And in the 80s, when we were making chips, we were using 12 elements. In the 90s, we added five. But after 2000s, we started using almost a complete table of Mendeleev, except for the radioactive materials. 
Now, if you think about this, where are they coming from, that for, um, uh, sovereignty? Well, many of them are not coming from Europe, they're coming from elsewhere. Many of them, like Iridium, but also gold, are not abundant at all. And if you go to the geologist and you ask them what are our reserves, then they say, well, peak gold was in 2001. So since then, the gold mines are producing less gold. Um, so you have uh, the conium, nickel, they are all in, in, in almost around peak, their peak. If you go to 2200, which is less than 200 years uh, away from now, most of these minerals will be completely depleted. They're gone. So we will have to replace them by others. So if you think about the long-term sustainability, we will have to recycle them from the products. But then you have UP Core, which is one of the most advanced companies um, in recycling. Of the 60 elements that you find in the smartphone, only they are at this moment able to extract only 17. The others are gone. So that means that we have to find them new ones uh, from, from fresh um, uh, ores. We have to extract them for the, from, the, from the earth first. At this moment, only 15% of the um, electronic equipment is recycled. So these are numbers that really, if you think about sustainability, I think we have to be careful and to work on this. So there are some good examples, like here, this is the Fairphone. It can uh, be taken apart and you can replace individual, uh, individual parts. So that's probably a, a good attempt in order to increase the lifetime, because that's the first thing you have to do is increase the lifetime uh, of devices. This is my last slide. Uh, I looked also at the priorities of the NTIOT. And I saw here in the economic and societal priorities that sustainability was number 10. Not very high in the priority. I can understand that if you just think about the economic impact of IoT, that you put it there. But if you think about the European Green Deal and sustainability, that might change. And here you see in the research, innovation, deployment priorities, it's even at the last point which is in the long term not a good idea. Biocompatible, I think that's also biodegradable, which could be a solution for the, uh, uh, the environmental impact. But I also see sustainability here at the first um, uh, priority, reliable, low cost and sustainable. Now, I believe that low cost and sustainable, they don't go together very well, in the sense that if it's low cost, if it does not cost more than a pen, you will probably replace it quickly and fast. If it's an expensive device, we'll probably take care of it, try to repair it. So I just, I don't want to crash your party here. Um, but I just want to say yeah. sustainability is around the corner. And I think we should also take that into account, especially for the long term. Thank you, Ken. Uh, sorry to cut into your words, but we have to speed up. And actually, as Federico will have the opportunity to tell you more in details, it was not in the order of priority. So I think the points you have highlighted are very high in the agenda. Uh, we will discuss more about this later on. So now, um, if you can stop sharing your screen, we will pass uh, to uh, a session in which we will have uh, three uh, speakers. Um, I will share quickly now my screen. <clears throat> we have uh, John Soldato from National University of Athens. Uh, we have uh, uh, Intrasoft, sorry, I think. John? Intrasoft. Soft, right? Of course, Monica, I'm your partner, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but here I see some wrong uh, information yeah, in the slides been, that I was given. Yeah, in, in the program. Yeah. So we have Patrick Pipe uh, from NXP Semiconductors, and then we have Ronald Begier, Begier from uh, TNO. Actually, uh, the time is a little bit uh, messed up now because we running a little bit late, it means that the Q&A session will be uh, shortened a bit. But I strongly recommend you to keep it concise and to come to the <clears throat> point you want to make. Question, do you have slides? Yes. John? I have slides. Okay, yes. so I stopped sharing my screen and you can share and go ahead. And then <clears throat> we will uh, give the floor directly from John to Patrick and then to Ronald. Okay. I hope you can see my slides. No? Yes, not yet presentation mode. Okay.
Okay, so why um, uh, TinyML uh, will give the smartest, the, the smartness to uh, the most tiny devices, um, uh, and why it's a big opportunity? So when we, when we hear the word artificial intelligence, instantly what it comes to, to our minds in terms of hardware is uh, 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 clouds, uh, GPUs, CPUs, and so on. We know this is not always the best option because we want to, to take advantage of the opportunity of the edge, the computing and the benefit of the edge. We know we have also some AI on our smartphones if we use the Siri application or the OK Google uh, and so on. Now, how about having AI on uh, microcontrollers? And you know, I'm blocking the potential of the billions of uh, embedded devices that we, we have nowadays, which are also growing uh, annually. Uh, what if we could run AI on a microcontroller, for example, to the sensor uh, on a plant and be able to instantly discover a, a problem with a disease or in industrial maintenance, uh, put something directly on the machine and uh, identify a defect without uh, having to do uh, complex processing uh, on the cloud, so instant response uh, uh, and, and faster. Well, this opportunity is here. It's called uh, TinyML. Sometimes we call it also um, AI uh, IoT. Uh, and the idea is uh, pretty simple. Uh, you train a deep neural network, then you shrink the size of the network, and you deploy this on a, on a, on a microcontroller, um, and, and you have it running there. So that's the, the uh, evolution from cloud AI to smartphone AI uh, to tiny ML. Well, if you do this, you get all the benefits of uh, edge computing and uh, far edge computing, so like uh, you know, low latency, bandwidth savings, uh, less opportunities for privacy links, all the things you know, but linking to the previous presentation, I would like to, to stay to the improved uh, environmental performance and to the reduced power consumption. A microcontroller uh, consumes much less power than any electronic component. You saw a list in the previous presentation with hundreds or thousands of milliwatts for different components. Now imagine that even if you if you've got a display or Bluetooth or an accelerator or a GPS, you need some hundreds of uh, a milliwatts. With microcontrollers, you can operate with only a few milliwatts. And yes, this is possible. It's not strange because uh, if you work on deep learning, you know that it's largely about matrices multiplication and less fetches on, on the memory. So it's possible to run uh, deep learning on the, uh, on the microcontroller. And this is why there is some momentum of tiny ML and some deals already in uh, 2020 and some investments on startups. Now, you can do this today in your project. There are some very good development boards. I picked three uh, used available in the market, but used also a lot for research and experimentation, uh, like the, the Arduino uh, Nano or the Spark Finance Development Board, Apollo 3, uh, 32 bits. Uh, uh, ARM pro uh, uh, processors where you can deploy your uh, deep learning model. What about the software? Well, it's the usual stuff we use in deep learning. So uh, like Python, Keras, uh, TensorFlow, of course, you need the Arduino tools to, to deploy the sketches. Uh, and uh, what is key here, there, there is a version of uh, TensorFlow, there is a release of TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite, and TensorFlow Lite Macro, that allows you to, to, to shrink the size of the deep learning model and deploy it on the network. Now, where we can become champions, given that it's all, all there, so we can deploy simple applications on the microcontrollers, but here are some uh, research directions. So what happens if you want to go to Sumarm AI or distributed AI and you have an heterogeneous network of uh, devices and you want to leverage tiny ML there. So there, the optimization of a deep neural network and the shrinking of the model can be challenging across the network. Another thing is that you know we have a talent gap in IoT, we have a talent gap in uh, machine learning and AI. It's difficult to find people that combine the two. Well, there is an opportunity there if you make auto ML work for tiny ML, which means automatic selection of the best deep neural network you can have a great opportunity for applications and tools that could make 
uh, could create champions. Of course, how you optimize uh, ML, uh, tiny ML pipelines for specific applications, and uh, last, the last fine point, but not least, power optimization. Of course, a microcontroller will never be alone. At some point, you will have to transmit the data. So if you can balance the trade-offs, transmit data only when, when, uh, when are needed, you can achieve uh, power, uh, significant power optimization on your system as a whole. And many of the tiny ML startups that are trending today, and they, they have raised a lot of uh, investment, private investment and funds, they are working on this direction. Uh, because I'm on the EU IoT uh, project with uh, Monique, and of course, it's a, it's a partner, we are a core partner there. Uh, we have prioritized tiny ML as one of our topics for the far edge. So you will see that in our roadmaps, we will document, of course, in terms of uh, training presentations and mini courses, what you can do with tiny ML. We will publish a success story and we hope to collaborate with the community. Uh, to excel in this uh, emerging area with very high momentum. So that's all for, for the time being. Uh, I think we can, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions later in the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, also for keeping it in time. I switched off my video because I had some problems. Now I give the floor to Patrick. Patrick, you can uh, share your screen if you have slides. Yes, I do have slides and I will share my screen. Great. Thank you. So now you should see my screen. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. So uh, I would like to give some view on uh, intelligence at the edge from an NXP semiconductor's point of view. Just for those who don't know NXP, we are the largest European semiconductor company with a revenue of almost nine uh, billion dollars. Uh, with uh, headquarters in Eindhoven in the Netherlands and with large research centers in many countries in Europe, like France, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria, uh, Czech Republic, and Romania. So what we see is the trend is that we are evolving from on demand towards being ahead of demand. I think societal expectations are very high towards uh, edge devices. Uh, as customers, we have been trained to expect more and more from our devices, and we always want to look further to remove barriers to operate in today's world. And so smart connected devices are already on the market. They have come a long way, but there is still a long way to go. And we sometimes say we are evolving from IoT to AIoT from, uh, towards the artificial intelligence of things. So if we look at the evolution of the semiconductor market since uh, 2000 till now, we see that in the first part of the century, uh, laptops, desktops, mobile phones, game consoles, uh, home audio were driving uh, the evolution of semiconductors. Since 2010, we have smartphones and we have data center servers, which have been stimulating the growth of semiconductors. And we see new opportunities in the future, like uh, uh, autonomous uh, driving, uh, secure edge devices, 5, 6G communication, personalized robotics, etc. We also see different trends, uh, like, for example, reverticalization of uh, large companies acting more locally instead of globally due to some trade tensions and to the pandemics and sustainability, which becomes more and more important. What we see is there are four forces uh, working in different directions. So your devices have to consume as less, as less energy as possible. But on the other hand, they have to become more performant and they have to tackle a larger complexity. Uh, on one hand, the cost has to go down drastically. I think we have already seen the example of the Nico uh, equipment from uh, Professor de Bosser. Uh, but on the other hand, the robustness has to be higher. Safety and security become more and more important. If we look to self-driving cars, I think safety is the number one requirement for this. But this gives opportunities for Europe. I think this can bring a sovereignty in some domains. This uh, contributes to the Green Deal. This contributes to evolving further and further in the digital age. And this can grow uh, the competitiveness of European players. As Max Lemke has been stating, we have a lot of companies active in the edge computing domain. Uh, let's focus on this. 
This is a picture I have taken from the uh, Electronic Component and Systems Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda uh, to 2021, which has been launched uh, last week at the FX conference. Uh, and this is a source of Gertepe. Uh, we see, and this was already shown before, we see the central computing, the cloud computing, uh, the AI servers, central servers at the right hand side. We see embedded computing at the left hand side, short distances, and we have near computing in the middle, which connects the edge to the cloud and has local servers. At the left side, you really see deep edge of intelligent sensors and uh, edge of efficient performance energy embedded systems. What we state is let's focus on the left hand side of the picture and a bit on the middle. Uh, let's fight for these battles in Europe and let's make sure we win these battles. And let not, let's not focus too much on the right hand side because it doesn't make sense to focus on battles which you have lost already or get lost. So we are evolving towards a new era of electronic devices. Uh, you see in the middle the cloud with the uh, high uh, performance data centers, the large processing power, huge memories, and they are connected to different application domains, personal devices, industrial devices, home appliances and transportation devices, all with specific requirements in terms of real-time security, ultra low power, uh, low cost functional safety. So data collection, processing and decisions need to be taken at the edge and edge devices need to be connected in a secure way to the cloud. This is some examples of uh, product families uh, which NXP has available. So at the left hand side, you see the deep edge AI, uh, lower end applications which can run on microcontrollers with appropriate software enablement. At the right side, we are here in the embedded AI with mid to high end applications, which require certain hardware acceleration and specialized architectures. For example, of a color ray technology uh, that we have available is focusing on this mid to high end devices in uh, autonomous driving, for example. At the left hand side, you see the different application domains, automotive, industrial, IoT, consumer, communications and health, where you have different examples here of uh, anomaly detection, phase recognition, etc. And where we have the IMX processor family and also our S32 platforms, which are really focusing on deep edge AI and edge computing, deep edge computing. And what is important, we need to sense, think, act, connect everything together in a safe and secure way for this type of deep edge devices. So last slide, uh, what we see is that the last decade was really about the big data handling. Now our next decade will start to work on the relevant data and edge processing is an enabler towards this trend. It's not anymore about the big storage, the big compute, but it's about efficient and scalable processing, very low power consumption, best in class sensing and connectivity, intelligence in the sensor itself, robustness, safety and security, and an efficient software ecosystem for further development and for on the air device management. And uh, as already stated before, Europe has leading industries and competences in these areas and these technologies, but we have to make sure that we can actively keep these competences in Europe. So this concludes my talk. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Um, now, Ronald, I give you the floor directly. You can share your screen. Here we go. We can see you. Okay, so if everything is going well, you can see my screen. Uh, yes, we can. Okay, and it is even uh, in presentation mode. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm working at uh, TNO, AZ Embedded Systems Innovation, and TNO is the Dutch Applied uh, Technology Institute. Um, I'm working there as a senior project manager, and uh, if I uh, yeah, would phrase uh, the scope of the AZ is uh, managing complex uh, complexity in high-tech systems through architecting, system reasoning, and model-driven engineering. Uh, I'm here today in the role of uh, co-author of the Embedded Systems chapter in the 
Excel roadmap. Um, and what you see is that uh, within TNO or AZ, is our focus is on the high tech systems uh, industry in the Netherlands, where you have semiconductor lithography, uh, professional printing, logistics, healthcare, uh, microscopes, and even security systems uh, like radar. Um, what you see is that they are all complex, but they are all more and more connected to the internet. And as such, they become things on the internet. They are not in very high volume, but they uh, require uh, all kinds of provisions, uh, which we also discussed today on the internet of things. We are not so actually, this is a kind of far edge uh, uh, proposals. So what you see is that uh, the challenges are multidimensional. Uh, it becomes more and more multidisciplinary, multi-partner in a complete value chain. Uh, the engineering scope is widening. It's not only putting a product on the market, but you have to cover it the whole life cycle. And there are strong links with sustainability and uh, green, which we already discussed before. Then, uh, yeah, there, there are also new uh, business propositions uh, where you see that uh, systems become more complex and you would like to have the users and operators uh, yeah, to provide support to them, to them to get the most out of the systems. And what you can see is that uh, early phase system engineering decisions uh, will last for a very long time in a lot of uh, systems, even up to 30 years. I have one example that's uh, from the healthcare uh, market where you see that uh, typically in the past you were selling uh, products which you can pack and which you can send to a customer. Uh, then you see uh, that uh, they become adaptable and configurable that each customer could use it in their own. Then they become context sensitive uh, because they need to be integrated in clinical procedures. Uh, so for each procedure, you have different settings. You use the machine in a different way. And nowadays, they become integrated in the whole hospital organization. So it's not only the quality of an image of a system, but it is also how it works in, the, in an uh, operating theater, but also how it contributes to the turnover of hospitals. So this is just one example, and you could give them in automotive, and you could give them in uh, semiconductors too. Then to the uh, Excel SRAs, uh, Research and Innovation Agenda, I should put an I in between. Uh, what we did is we took the market opportunities as a starting point, and then answered what kind of challenges, technology challenges are there to answer uh, these markets requests. So it is on the, uh, uh, as Patrick already mentioned, it is just announced on the FX uh, 2021. And you see that uh, it's kind of schematic where you see in green the application chapters, in blue the foundational technology layers and cross-sectional technologies in purple. Um, the market opportunity. Uh, is very large, especially in the application scene, especially also where Europe has its strengths. So of course you need the semiconductors, as Patrick explained, but the big market opportunities is applying them in uh, solutions on the market. And there you see also that the software content is growing and growing and a lot of functionality is provided by the software content. And in this picture for the EU, uh, uh, it's, it's a 500 billion challenge over the years. So translated that into systems, and this picture uh, shows the role of embedded software, and we call it and beyond because it is also um, enabling the, the connectivity outside. You see that a lot of software is just making hardware uh, functionality available to their users. Uh, and there you see continuous integration between hardware and software. You need to be reliable, trusted, and secure, as already mentioned by Patrick. Um, but you also want to engineer it efficiently. Um, and together with that, 
is also embedding data analytics and AI, hybrid computing platforms. So you see a lot of technologies and multidisciplinary integrated. So if you have your hardware in, it's not yet a system. So then you need to have functionality to make the system to provide the functionality to the end user. And you have to yeah, cover that through the whole life cycle. Uh, and then integrate it into that functionality. So not only working hardware, but also providing functionality to the end user, then you get a full functional embedded system. If I remember the, the, the talk of Paoli, where he discussed also a system of system, then a system of system is a collection of fully independent embedded cyber physical systems. And then you provide solutions to the key application areas, like I provided one example from healthcare. So in the, the SRA, we drafted uh, the five challenges for embedded uh, software, efficient engineering of software, continuous integration and deployment, life cycle management, sustainability and clean, embedding data analytics, uh, software reliability and trust. And they are mapped out over the, the time and it's not intended that you read here. I provide just two examples on the short term where you see challenges for efficient engineering is not only about tooling, but it's also about technology and model-based software engineering. And here you see the challenges defined by the expert group uh, for the short term. The same holds for life cycle management. Yeah, systems uh, has a long lifetime, sometimes over 30 years. So we need to keep them alive and we call it rejuvenation. Uh, quite a lot of us, is attention is paid on digital twinning. So having a simulator in parallel also to manage all the configurations out there on the market to manage complexity over time. So basically, this is my last slide and uh, thanks for inviting me and open for discussions uh, now. Back to Katrien. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So um, now um, we will uh, pass to a discussion part um, that uh, we might keep a bit shorter than planned, but uh, I would like to uh, take the opportunity. I will share the screen so you should see now just um, a discussion slide. Um, so I've been taking some notes and I've been also noting some of the questions that emerged. <clears throat> of course, it would be great to be able to, to, to have uh, some discussion with all of the speaker. Uh, but um, now I have uh, one question that was raised by um, uh, Rolf uh, from the European Commission for Paolo. And the question is about the risk of uh, fragmentation into the IoT landscape, because as we've heard from the several speakers, there's a lot of different technologies and research communities that are somehow converging at the edge. So, um, of course, there is this risk. On the other hand, um, there is uh, a clear um, now openness from organizations like Artemis uh, uh, and others uh, to, to play together, to cooperate. And especially at the level of cooperation on the standardization fronts uh, or open source initiatives, it's very important that uh, Europe, uh, European players join forces. Paolo, could you, could you tell us a little bit what's the position of um, Artemis with respect to joint venture and, and uh, cooperation aspects? Yes, Rolf is perfectly right. According to one of the last uh, study that I have seen, we have today. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, okay, there's a bit of delay. Um, I was saying that Rolf is right. Uh, according to one of the recent studies that I've seen, there are more than 600 uh, IoT solutions out there. So there is a lot of fragmentation. And, and Artemis has been always a very, very sensitive to the collaboration with other European initiatives related to IoT. And we, we devoted a lot of effort to this topic. There is an issue in IoT. IoT is 
based strongly on sharing information. But companies that are involved in the market prefer to base their business on customer lock-in. So basically, they don't want to share. They don't want to use standard. They don't want to cooperate. And this is a huge issue that is affecting significantly the uptake of uh, IoT. This is the reality that we see every day on the market. So the more, in my opinion, we will invest in cooperation between the European initiative, the more we will invest in interoperability, in standard, the quicker we will solve this important issue. And this is something that we have to solve very, very quickly. Yes, indeed. I think this relates very much also to a point that Max made uh, in his opening that is about joining forces. So um, we know that if European uh, players, if European stakeholders do not join forces, it's going to be very difficult uh, to uh, actually stay competitive also at global level. And how this will be done, it's a big, uh, it's a big uh, challenge, right? Uh, so I would like to hear uh, from, from the speakers, what do they think is necessary uh, for bringing together the main actors? Maybe other speakers, because Paolo just mentioned uh, his point. Um, who volunteers to answer this question? I can uh, give my view on this question. Please go uh, ahead. It is completely necessary to indeed work together more intensively. And we see this evolution coming. If I look in the past towards, for example, the automotive value chain, you typically had a semiconductor company develop, developing a chip, a tier one developing a board, and then a box, and then selling it to the OEM at the end, to the automotive manufacturer. What we see now more and more that these players are acting together. Uh, we as NXP are working together directly with automotive manufacturers, uh, also with tier ones. But this is really what we call a value network instead of a value chain. And as Paolo was stating, in some cases you want to lock in a customer uh, and you don't want to cooperate. But in other cases, you have to cooperate because you can only bring solutions if they are following a standard or if they are interoperable with other players. So you have to find a good mix there of uh, cooperation versus competition. And I think in Europe, it's very important that we keep working together in that way. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, I think uh, to complement on that, I would like to yeah, sure. uh, remark that, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is multi-complex. Uh, so you need all kinds of disciplines working together, um, uh, semiconductors, but also the software development, but also AI to make one complete uh, system out of it. In, indeed, there is a, a quite articulated and complex complex stack um, from from lower um, manufacturing aspects to higher even uh, soci sociological ethical ethical. Today we didn't have a lot of time to discuss on legal and ethical aspects uh, concerned. Um, but one of the things when we talk about uh, fragmentation and, and um, strength of Europe, I think that by definition, the, the decentralization and distribution of the edge uh, somehow fits very much to the market um, and to the overall uh, European ecosystem. We know that there, it, we have a panorama that is pretty disconnected, but in this case, this can become very much of a strength. Now, um, how to ensure that also small participants, small uh, um, business players, SMEs, startups can effectively be engaged and involved in this value chain that the edge uh, computing uh, is creating? Any specific view on SME engagement from any one of you? Yeah, if, if I may answer, I think what you see, often see, is that in the SMEs, you have the, uh, the, the new uh, advanced uh, initiatives and products or services where you start small and uh, experiment a lot and have the freedom to experiment a lot. Uh, and I think that's, uh, the, yeah, they are often very innovative, not always even successful. Uh, but I think that that gives a, uh, a wide space to uh, 
to add to uh, the market and give them uh, freedom to uh, to start. Correct. Well, uh, I fully agree with you, uh, Ronald. And I think it's important, uh, especially also for large companies, to work together with the small and medium-sized enterprises because they are often covering topics for which there is no room to work upon in a big company. Yeah. And if they have good technology at the end, uh, it's a long-term relationship or even big companies can acquire these uh, smaller companies. But it's important to stay, uh, I would say, at the edge of the knowledge uh, in many domains to work together with them. Paolo, actually... Yeah, I, uh, may, in, yeah. I may add to this discussion. I think that um, Patrick mentioned an important aspect of IoT. IoT, for its inherent nature, is deeply networked. And um, so when, when you go to the value chain, uh, you, you lose this linearity. And uh, it's better to think to a value network. Patrick mentioned it before. The value network is, is, is a concept that better described what is happening on the market with IoT. And what is, practically speaking, the way in which the entry point for an SME to enter the market is the IoT platform that at the end you use. And uh, if in the future we will have the, the availability of open platforms, so platform that will allow uh, small entities to enter the market in an easy way with a low effort, this will be the key for small and medium enterprises. Because very typically, uh, they don't have the resources, they don't have the capabilities to enter the market because they, they, they are not able to use the platform, to use the software that, practically speaking, um, give life to, to the IoT market. So, so I think this connects very well to what John was uh, somehow um, presenting, because it's also a matter of educating and providing the right digital skills. Uh, yeah. Uh, for many of the players that, uh, you know, they could, uh, from, uh, from an overall cost point of view, afford, um, but they cannot because they don't have in-house the expertise. John, can you, can you add something specifically about Yes, uh, Monique, and if you allow me, you know, one uh, or two points in the previous discussion. Uh, of course, uh, the landscape is going to uh, stay fragmented because we are going to have different aspects of... Uh, uh, Internet of Things from the far edge to the cloud and, of course, blended with different aspects of AI. So what is very important, I think, for European uh, enterprises to be able to excel, especially the smaller ones, um, is to be positioned where, where there is a strong ecosystem uh, in Europe. Of course, you can always have a, a very bright SME that excels and is doing great things and is is selling all over the world, but if you want to actually have a critical mass, we have to go where we have um, a strong ecosystem. And um, my opinion is that uh, the, the, the opportunity that uh, uh, Dr. Lempia was presenting in the morning is, most, is more on the industrial uh, IoT manufacturing is, for example, uh, is an example because there Europe has a very strong uh, ecosystem. So a value network with uh, machine builders, OEMs, uh, integrators, you know, can make a difference and can set innovator apart from uh, uh, from the rest. Now, uh, among the prerequisites, the, 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 the digital skills, the training, also very much the uh, equity equity investment, and I think that uh, Europe is doing, you know, some good steps uh, there, but we are still, you know, lagging uh, behind. Uh, uh, for example, the United States, but we are doing very good steps with the European Investment Bank. So this among the, the of course, you need uh, to ensure that people have the, the, the right uh, digital skills. And actually, if we really talk about AI, deep learning, machine learning, uh, this starts from the very early stages, right? It's not just university education, it's a, it's a whole shift to, to, to STEM uh, education for Europe, which continues, you know, and uh, and uh, which, which continues to the, uh, you know, university education, uh, researchers, and so on. So these are, of course, some of the ingredients, but I think a strong ecosystem and uh, uh, the possibility for smaller enterprises to, to attract equity investment, uh, these, are, these are very important ingredients in order to have the champions, right? Especially if you see the figures yeah. comparing to United States and China. 
Actually, this, this uh, also relates to another factor. We've heard that now um, there's investments that will come to promote not only research, but also innovation and deployment of edge computing. And of course, the level of maturity um, of different edge solutions, um, of different technologies is, uh, is rather diverse in the scenario. So um, one of the key things is gonna be to achieve the proper balance between research, innovation, and deploy deployment adoption, let's say. Uh, what do you think uh, it's the most challenging aspect to ensure that there is a balanced, um, that there is a balance between these three aspects, uh, research, innovation, and deployment. What do you think Europe needs to invest the most to make it happen effectively within the next, uh, let's say, few years, because the race has already started? No one wants to go ahead. Yeah, I can give a start if you want. Uh, Thank you. According to me, research and innovation are the key pillars Europe should invest in. Uh, if I look to deployment, this is very close to the market and this is the business of companies, uh, both big companies, small and medium sized enterprises. You can do some, I would call it field tests and some experiments. Uh, if you call that deployment, then of course it's also important to invest in this type of large-scale experiments in Europe. But the real deployment should happen on the market, in my opinion, and the key investment should be in research and innovation. Thank you, Patrick. So, um, uh, do we want to maybe uh, hear also from... Uh, uh, Roluc or Paolo on, on priorities for IoT, research, innovation or deployment? How do you see the game there? Yeah, if I may start. Um, as Patrick said, uh, research and innovation are fundamental, um, specifically in a, in a domain, uh, the IoT one, that is growing and will evolve very, very quickly. Um, What's happening very frequently in IoT is the fact that uh, research is not capable to follow the evolution of the market. Typically, uh, industry has to find solution very quickly. And in many, many, many cases, products uh, that are already on the market has not, a, uh, has not a, a, an historical research background. In my opinion, um, there are four, five uh, topics that needs to be um, uh, investigated and uh, in which we have to find a solution uh, very quickly. First of, first of all, uh, the, the, the lack of trust that currently there is in IoT. I remember one very, one very good uh, sentence, in IoT we must trust. And this is important because uh, the absence of trustworthiness it's a huge obstacle for the uptake of IoT. I remember you that IoT will deal with, with uh, uh, confidential and, and very sensible information. Um, so it, this is a very delicate point. Then uh, there's, there's the issue of interoperability that uh, uh, is strictly related to what we discussed before. Uh, we have, as I said in my presentation, to find the right trade-off. And also Patrick confirmed this. Um, the right trade-off between the confidentiality that the, the companies need for their business. And, and this is unavoidable. Um, and uh, the right trade-off between this confidentiality and the, the openness that is required to share information and to build these value networks and to um, give the possibility to the, all the stakeholders to make business in the value network. Then there is hyperconnectivity. Uh, IoT is based on connectivity. Without connectivity, IoT would not exist for sure. And uh, hyperconnectivity is uh, another delicate part because for us, it's a commodity. But in any case, considering the evolution and the numbers that we have seen in the presentations, uh, we will have to invest also on connectivity to ensure that it will be scalable. 
And then, as I said, platforms. Um, this allows me also to uh, answer to one question that has been posted in the chat. Um, in Europe, uh, we have an important initiative that is uh, um, guided by the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, the Eclipse uh, guys are presenting uh, uh, some speeches here in this workshop. They have an entire um, part of their activities focused entirely on IoT. And uh, in that context, uh, we have, there are all open source uh, projects. Um, one of the, I think that one of the most important objective of these project, projects is to facilitate the adoption of IoT. This is, I think, one of the most important objectives they have. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo. I, I, I see that you basically also answered to one of the questions that I was looking in the, in the chat. Sorry. Um, now, um, we, uh, I would like to ask one last question um, before we then pass to the second part of the workshop. And the next question is very much about, um, you know, who, what, we've been talking and, and, and listening to several interventions as also represent bodies um, that gather um, industrial players, that gathers technology uh, providers, and um, one of the key things is how do we engage or how, do, how much do we need to bring into the dialogue, um, into the you know, uh, cooperation verticals and how to foster this um, you know, closer interaction with specific verticals where indeed IoT and edge solutions are crucial for the future of our society. So um, if, uh, if you are aware of specific efforts there, um, liaising uh, specifically uh, to verticals. First of all, Monique, that, that's very important. And uh, you know, just to link it to the previous question, right, uh, about research, innovation, de deployment, it depends you know, who you ask, right, for this question. Because um, uh, at least my experience in playing, you know, a little bit also the devil's advocate uh, with respect to the to the previous viewpoints, uh, some big companies still ask uh, how I'm going to make money from IoT, right? I mean, you know, big telcos, uh, big integrators. Where where is really the money in IoT? So, uh, in my uh, view, this means that we still have to do also, you know field experimentation, but also deployment and market validation. Because if you see, you know, big, big guys like big telcos asking, how am I going to make money from IoT? It means, you know, that we haven't reached, uh, you know, plateau. There is a lot of opportunity, I said, and we need, uh, at some cases, to prove uh, uh, the opportunity. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, um, this is, uh, you know, the question, research, innovation, deployment is a, uh, is, uh, uh, who you ask to also to uh, to a large extent. Of course, we are R&D guys, and we uh, believe very much in, in uh, research and innovation. But at the end of the day, you uh, you have to to improve the bottom line, right, of, of the companies that you get their uh, uh, investment. Yeah, from my perspective, I would like to add that you need a good mixture of a vertical and a horizontal cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, you, for example, in Europe, you're very strong in industry, in automotive, and you have to work together in these verticals from the semiconductor company, embedded software company, up to the uh, final OEM. On the other hand, if you look at requirements of reliability, safety, uh, trustworthiness, these are important for all verticals and there in fact you need to set up some horizontal cooperation to ensure that you find the right solutions in this area which are valid for multiple type of verticals but indeed i think economy is driven by the verticals i think that's a fact of life and uh, we have to live with this and work along this yes i, I fully agree Thank you very much. just one last quick comment uh, um. Quick. I fully yes, agree with you, you both, both. and uh, I think that we, when it comes to verticals, uh, we need really a, cult a cultural change uh, because uh, 
IU, when you consider verticals, IoT enters the processes, the organizations, um, the model, the business models of these companies that are involved in the in the verticals. So you completely change their world, and uh, this brings them to a cultural change, a deep cultural change. Thank you, Paolo. I think um, we've touched some points that we deserve on their own uh, hours of discussion, for instance, ethical uh, acceptance, uh, um, even a trust on technologies. Um, and of course, this is something that we might you know, discuss later on in, in, uh, the, in this series of workshops. Now, what I would like to give a chance is to uh, our next speakers uh, to take stage. We have Gianluca Ferrari, uh, Sofia, Angelo Consaro, and Andrea Bartoli. Um, I, I would like to thank, first of all, all the speakers of this first part and uh, give now the floor to uh, Gianluigi. Thank you, Monique. Can you see me and hear me correctly? We can see and we can hear you. I don't know if you have slides or will... Yes, if you can allow me to I share, then... I can share. Yes, please go ahead. You should be able now. Yes. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Not in presentation mode yet, but... Let's see. Can you, see, can you see them in presentation mode now? Um, we still have a black screen. I think it's still opening. Let me try again. Okay, meanwhile, uh... Uh, Catherine, can you, uh, Verena, can you open the um, poll yeah. that we have for all the speakers? So in which of these three areas should the EU invest? More on research, more on innovation, more on deployment. So please uh, go ahead and you can express a percentage. In the meantime, Gianluigi, you can try to share your screen. Let me try again. It looks mm -hmm. like I have issues with now SharePoint. Do, you want, do we want to pass to Ute Sofia and maybe you, you send the slides to us so that we can share them afterwards, Gianluigi? Let me try one more time. Uh, can you see, see them now? Yes. Now, yes. Can you see them in full mode? No, not yet. Black screen. No, it's no, better no. if you leave it. Uh, on PDF. On PDF, okay, let yes. me. And then you scroll down, because we could see that. Okay, ah, can you see perfect. them now? Now we see them perfectly. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry for the delay, so problem of connectivity. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. This is a joint uh, talk with uh, my colleague Dimitrios Serpanos. We are both members of the Scientific Council of Artemis. So we will try to, I will try to show you our view on connectivity side protocols for devices. Now, the keywords in the title are two, basically. There is devices, and then there is connectivity side protocols. Uh, by devices, we typically refer to things, and that uh, leads to Internet of Things. And uh, as already mentioned, especially by, in the presentation by Paolo, connectivity is fundamental because we need to connect devices to the cloud. Uh, again, this is a concept which has already been presented by Patrick. Uh, there is a change in perspective which is going on. So from IoT, we are moving towards AIoT. Now in IoT, you collect things, you collect data from things and uh, you don't really uh, assume that there is intelligence in the things. So you collect a large amount of data with no structure, let's say. But with the artificial intelligence of things, uh, you want to make one step further. You want to process data locally, extract information, and then just send relevant data. Now, if you think about this paradigm shift, then it's, it's immediate to understand that the edge, and in particular the far edge, which is the topic of today's workshop, is, is crucial. In fact, like the edge needs to embed intelligence, and 
the fact that there is intelligence at the far edge basically allows to bring, to bring the cloud closer to devices. Um, it was already mentioned that Artemis has identified six focus areas, which are key, let's say, technologies for the future development of like, uh, let's say, of digital, uh, digital uh, digitalization. And in most of these key technologies, connectivity has a key role. Of course, when you talk about connectivity, automatically you need to take into account also security because when you want to connect things, then you have to make sure that like this connection is secure. Now, this is a perspective about edge computing from, let's say, a cellular point of view. So you can see that like edge computing can have like different, let's say, flavors. You have cloud edge, which is close to the cloud, edge cloud, which is moving like in the middle, and then you have the concept of edge gateway. And the edge gateway in this context uh, is fundamental to allow protocol and interface conversion. So you see that basically the far edge is moving like towards the left. And in some sense, you can think about intelligent things as the part of the far edge. Now, this is what's happening from an IoT point of view. If you think about a sensor network, which is a typical IoT scenario, uh, a typical cloud solution is a solution where you have uh, several sensors. They collect data through a sensor hub. And then all the processing, for example, based on machine learning or other AI um, tools, is carried out in the cloud. But now, with the advancement of electronics and also with the advancement of processing, it was mentioned in a previous presentation by John, for example, TinyML, it's becoming more and more interesting to embed intelligence into sensors. So from this scenario in the left, you move to the scenario on the right, where in some cases, you don't even need the cloud. Well, you have sensors processing data locally and then sending the results of this processing. Now, if you think about this uh, scenario, automatically you think that to embed intelligence, you re really to consider connectivity protocols. And there are like several wireless connectivity protocols. And here in the left, uh, there is a few of them are highlighted, uh, considering their mapping in terms of connectivity range versus uh, data rate, so speed. And you see that here, 5G is like the top uh, right angle edge of this scenario. So there is a lot of expectations from 5G, also from the point of view of IoT. On the other hand, if you look at the industrial world, so we move to the right of the figure, uh, there is industrial ethernet, and there are a lot of field bus protocols. For example, there is Modbus, Modbus TCP, CAN, Profibus. Now, if you think about this picture, like, and if you want to consider really connectivity to the next level, you have to make protocols interoperable. And the interoperability is the key to basically move from IoT to system of systems. Now, of course, as we mentioned before, it's very important to, to take into account security. At the bottom here, there is a very simple example of an industrial system where you have a control center and then you have a machine and the machine is like controlled by actuators and provides feedback to the control center by sensors. And you can see that there can be attacks in any place basically of this uh, diagram. And besides the blocks, there can also be problems in the connectivity errors. So connectivity needs to fundamentally from a design point of view, take into account security. Now to conclude, since time is very short, uh, basically, current connectivity protocols can be defined as intelligence agnostic. So they do not really embed intelligence. But you think of a new perspective on connectivity. Uh, connectivity could themselves embed intelligence. And this intelligence could make like, uh, the interaction between the far edge and the devices much more effective. Of course, if you want to move to intelligent connectivity protocols, then uh, there are several challenges which make this very interesting. First of all, uh, it's not clear how and where you could embed intelligence effectively. Uh, another aspect is that you have to make sure that protocols, which can be very heterogeneous, needs to be interoperable. And then there are also trade-offs. For example, there could be a trade-off between uh, distributed computation and transmission. So you embed more processing at the device 
or you share processing at various devices and then you spend more energy, for example, for transmission. And finally, security. You can have security in terms of secure processing, but also security in terms of secure transmission. So to conclude with the, let's say, proper connectivity side protocols, um, we really believe that the far edge will be the enabler of AIoT. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Gianluigi. Now I would give the floor to Uta directly. So we, okay. we can see you and we can hear you. Good. And now we see your slides. Perfect. Great. Okay. So hi, everybody. I'm Ruth Sofia, as Monique already presented, and I'm here representing Fortis. Uh, Fortis Institute of Bayern for Software Intensive Systems and Services. Just a moment. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Our presentation is not in presentation mode yet. Okay. What about now? Um, well, we, we do see your notes let's say um, but uh, when you so let's continue like way. this okay so i'm sorry but uh, i think it's faster okay if we go like this okay. is it okay yeah sure okay so again hi everybody uh, i'm representing i'm here on this uh, webinar representing fortis fortis is a research institute in bayern munich um, we focus on the development and research actually research and development of software intensive systems and services and uh, I am the head of the Industrial IoT Competence Center. And so today I'm going to speak a little bit about the role of, uh, of the open source and standardization in assisting us in bringing intelligence to the edge. And so on this figure, what you have is actually our vision, meaning the IoT Fortis vision into edge computing. So um we have we believe okay that this is something that is already happening in particular in the industrial domain but uh, i'll go over that in, in in a couple of slides so on the customer field level devices we actually don't have just any more let's say static devices we have smartphones we have actually cars robots but we also saw so one of the things that uh, uh, some of the colleagues that spoke today did not mention is that we also have new types of architectural networks coming in, such as the, the smart satellite constellations coming into the picture, not only as careers, but actually as, let's say, sort of end user service, so sensing. So if, so let me now try to give you a more closing perspective in terms of industrial IoT, where here this high level scheme represents, let's say, what we have today in the manufacturing domain. But by industrial IoT, as John mentioned, this is not just a, a, a manufacturing domain. So we, industrial IoT reaches, for instance, smart cities in terms of infrastructures. As we all know, it also reaches much more. So we health on people at work, et cetera, et cetera. So much more vertical domains. But basically, what, what we see today already happening is that on the uh, so customer premises and user side, the so-called industrial plants or shop floors, we actually have two types of devices, the so-called brownfield devices, all devices that actually are, let's say, uh, the most important, still the most important in terms of, uh, of uh, production lines, or if we go to the energy sector, turbines, wind turbines. And these devices often don't speak with the rest of the IoT end-to-end -end system. And so we use gateways to, to make them speak. So in other words, they are not seen yet as things in the end-to-end -end system. And then we have, of course, green, green field devices. So most of them are IP enabled. They already carry a bunch of different protocols that are being used to do communication, a data exchange across the, the IoT system. But we are also seeing, uh, uh, assisting to new changes such as, sorry, such as that these devices already bring in uh, wireless, so they can be connected in ad hoc mode. Still, uh, what we see, okay, is that all the data is, is being often pushed to the cloud or uh, worked in, in the edge. And in terms of edge, we are also assisting already to a few changes. So the blue boxes that you have here are basically microservices that run 
not anymore just on the cloud, but actually they also run more and more and more on the edge. So the notion of, of far edge is already slowly starting to happen also on the industrial domain. And for this, what the systems that are being uh, built are actually based on open source software. So we have, for instance, EdgeX from the Linux Foundation, which is the basis for a lot of, of, of systems around. However, uh, these are niches still. So several colleagues discussed this. I think Paolo mentioned that we have around 600 platforms on IoT. You have the figure there. And still the main issue, and I think Pedro mentioned that this is not an issue. I, I, I regret to say that I disagree. So interoperability is definitely the main issue. Interoperability here is, does not only relate with protocols. It relates with the fact that the different platforms are close. The data models that we have in vertical domains are also not interoperable. And so, investing on more than one platform requires a lot of human intervention and as i showed you today we have different services so intelligence on the edge etc which require create or using a different set of, of uh, platforms so another aspect that actually is blocking the adoption of iot concerns to the lack, lack of skills so for instance in the industrial domain but not only we have uh, operators that are basically trained to use a platform and however we have a fast technological advancement and what we see also is that there is a lack of skills in understanding which protocols uh, are best in, in, a, in a specific environment which data models should be used how to interconnect different vertical domains etc then last we also have so i would say these are the main the main issues we have standardization fragmentation. So in industrial IoT, we have around 200 different uh, standardization uh, associations, entities, etc. And in consumer IoT, it's, it, we have also the same. So the, the, the fragmentation that we have implies that we don't have universal implementations, but that's where, uh, in my opinion, open source software can help. So I would say that open source software is an enabler of innovation. So first of all, because it allows us to create uh, modular architectures, so microservice architectures, and we are already seeing that. Then because it allows us also to create easily portable solutions, something that we are seeing because most of these services that we see on the edge and on the cloud are now based on containerized solutions, so virtualization. Another relevant aspect is that it allows a better work between academia and industry because academia can work on the open source platforms that the industry is also investing on. And this attracts new developers, newcomers. So in terms of uh, it, it, open source is also, of course, as we all know, uh, let's say an igniter of new businesses. So it uh, not only brings the newcomers, it helps in helps, does not solve uh, the issue of transparency and trust and it allows solutions to, to, to get faster to market. However, there is one issue which I think was not much mentioned here, which is the need for certification, in particular in these critical environments, such as uh, industrial environments, uh, avionics or aeronautics, etc. Without strong certification, um, even though there may be more interoperability in terms of open source software, uh, there will always be some, some blockage. So uh, where to go? So I'm also, in addition to Fortis, I'm representing the new, co so as partner of the new cooperation and support action EU IoT, coordinated by, by Monique, where John is also involved. And one, one task that we have there is actually to assist in, in creating, let's say, uh, um, or building, continuing building, let's say, a better map of uh, open source initiatives, the software that we have. Uh, we spoke about the Eclipse Foundation, okay, again, on the industrial domain edgex is also very, very interesting. We have the Cloud Native Foundation. Then we have, of course, a series of projects starting in ICT56, so UIoT is, is within ICT56. And so we have also, sorry, a series of associations uh, that are also represented in this uh, workshop. So the, the intention of UIoT is actually to provide, to, to bring in newcomers, but also to provide, let's say, a better mapping between uh, the projects that are being developed, start being developed, and also uh, um, standardization and open source associations. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Ruta. Uh, now I pass the token to Angelo. Hello, Monique, and good morning, uh, everyone. Angelo, I guess can... you can hear me. Yes, yeah. we can so see you. Let me share my screen, well. and I will go full screen immediately. Yes. Perfect. Okay, brilliant. So let's get started. So uh, lots of interesting talks, and um, so I'm waiting very much forward for the for the let's say the discussion as well. So what I want to do today is introduce some project we've been working for a few years, and in a way represents uh, the journey that we have uh, that, that I've done in the past let's say 15 years. Um, you know, from working on um, a system that uh, would be defined OT. Okay, uh, uh, to eventually uh, helping out trying to to address some of the of the challenges that uh, that are coming with uh, uh, what we define the cloud to to things continue. Okay, so how are system rebuilt? I think there was a very good presentation. The first presentation was very good in in explaining that in reality, right, you have a continuum from the cloud to the things, and you have compute storage and communication, although with different protocols and different technologies, but they go from the data center down to uh, your device. Uh, devices are getting incredibly powerful. Um, I uh, well, I don't know the average age here around uh, around the meeting, but let's say um, my first computer had just hundreds of kilobytes of of RAM, and it was a lot back then. Okay, uh, so if you look at the Raspberry Pi today, a Raspberry Pi, I mean, it's like a supercomputer. Uh, if we had that in the 80s, so if you think the cost and the um, is coming down, the availability for compute. Uh, at our fingertips is going up. And so uh, this is really how actual system are. So we have store, compute, storage, compute, and, and communication essentially everywhere. But we have system built this way, but then we trivialize this, this, the system this way by taking you know, a cloud-centric approach in which uh, um, you know, for, I would say, conveniency and opportunity, because these were the technology that emerged uh, in a way first, uh, we trivialize in the system uh, in having either the cloud, let it be far or close, because um, sometimes, again, as mentioned in the first presentation, uh, people coming from the cloud world define the edge just as a cloud that is a little bit closer to your things. But for me, it's still uh, without any, you know, um, when I say trivialization, I, I don't mean to be ins insulting. It only means that we are reducing the system that is inherently more complex to a situation which, uh, you know, this infrastructure. Uh, which is very well controlled, powerful, and then uh, things uh, that are, uh, you know, dispersed and, uh, um, you know, although they could do more, uh, they rely entirely on the cloud to do, to do everything. So what are the consequences of this, uh, let's say, reduction or reductionism, let's say? Well, first of all, locality is not exploited. And uh, that induces consequences, obviously, on latency that are not applicable to some application areas, uh, just to quote one, um, you know, robotics application, for instance, okay? Um, energy uh, and uh, is impacted as well because um, most or many of the even domotic or uh, house automation application, I mean, you send the data to the cloud and then the day when you want to read the data, you get it out from the cloud, which is like, what? Um, I mean, that creates lots of entropy and I think we should be cautious on how we use energy. And recall that communication consumes far more energy than computation. So, you know, we should try to, uh, to exploit locality as much as possible. And by the way, as soon as you get data uh, going out of, let's say, your house, if we take this as an example, but that applies to a car, it applies to a robot, it, it applies to a tractor, to anything, then you have to pose concern about obviously privacy uh, besides all the, all the challenge and the concern that I mentioned before with respect to latency and energy. The other important point that I think few people realize is actually in today's system, you have no location transparency. Why? Because there is one location where everything happened, which is the cloud. And the people are already starting to see that with data lakes because all of a sudden, um, if you have data that sits across two data lakes, how do you actually know whether data is on data lake uh, one or data lake two? Uh, that's actually a problem that is giving rise to yet another you know, patch up solution like uh, cat data catalogs. But actually, if you look at the problem, the problem really is an, in an underlying assumption. Okay. So we, we have, you know, advocate, we've been about advocating for quite some time that you need liberum arbitrium. Um, and that means you should be able right, or technology should give you choice to decide where it makes the most sense to store your data, 
what is the most efficient way to communicate with those that are interested in this data, and what is the right place to place computations. Okay, and again, to do that in the continuum that represents our compute storage and communication fabric, going from the data center down to you know, the smallest device. Once again, smallest device today are still, from our perspective, very, very powerful. Uh, even if you consider a microcontroller like an Arduino Atmel, uh, you know, there are still lots of things that, that, that you can do on, uh, on that. So in line with, uh, with this principle, uh, we have uh, <clears throat> you know, recently started uh, within the Eclipse Foundation, a, a group called the uh, H-Native uh, uh, Working Group. Um, I was one of the, of the founder of this group. And our goal is really to try to, to create a series of technologies uh, that, were, uh, that are obviously open source. So that's why we did that in Eclipse. And that uh, are designed from the first principle to address the needs um, of application that really want to be able to leverage the, the continuum from um, the cloud to the device. And we're addressing the problem in a very systematic manner, trying to provide data plane, control plane, and management plane. So today I will talk about the data plane, which is Xeno, but then in the control and management plane, there are other two projects, FogOS and IOFOG. By the way, Xeno and FogOS, they are 100% European project, IOFOG, uh, the team is based in US, but, but that doesn't matter, it's still Eclipse. But I think in this discussion, it's important uh, to understand that on this subject, Europe actually, I mean, as we are a European team, I think it's actually leading and is having a, a big impact. And the reason uh, lies once again in one observation that was done in the very first presentation is that Europe has, has been historically very, very strong on OT technologies. We have, we have been very, very strong on uh, leaning already on what represented the edge. And as a consequence, even conceptually, there are some problems and, and, uh, that, that we are far more familiar. And our understanding of, let's say, how things need to work as soon as you get closer to the complicated world, right? Once you walk out of a data center, the world gets very complicated, believe me. I think in Europe there is far more competence and we need to exploit that because I fully agree you know, that with the point that was made earlier on, that's where Europe can really um, you know, build a strong position and uh, lead. Okay, so in that respect, um, as I mentioned, one of our technology that as a, you know, as a research group we have been, uh, we have been contributing and now it's, it's living in, within, within Eclipse, is Xeno. So why did we work on Xeno? Well, let me open a very quick parenthesis because I, I know I'm very, I have very small time. Just to give you some background, uh, it's over 20 years that I work on uh, protocols for distributed communication. Um, the European air traffic control system is built on a standard that uh, ICO invented, as an example, okay? Um, John Deere autonomous tractors, uh, they run on a protocol that, uh, that I worked on 15 years ago. So, uh, you know, I've been, I've been there, done that, and one of the problems that I could see while moving forward was, first of all, um, you know, the, the heterogeneity that now we have to deal with. As we saw in the previous presentation from Gianluigi, now you see that in an end-to-end -end system, you might have to deal with several different kinds of, of networking protocols. And uh, then if you are trying to uh, have communication end to end, uh, you want to hide uh, the fact that you have different networking protocols, but there aren't data sharing protocols that work end to end, okay? And so that was already one problem of fragmentation that we wanted to address, something that you could use from the cloud to the device, but that was not the only problem. The other problem is that as you grow with the scale, the dynamics in your system change, um, you are not able to always push data, as do most of the products that are used today. I mean, if we refer to cloud-centric technology, most people use MQTT. That's just a push protocol, okay? MQTT is based on TCP IP, doesn't go very well on personal area network, as an example, right? So you would have, in that case, to mix MQTT and COPE, and everything becomes a, a patchwork. But more importantly, the other problem is that there is no way of unifying data in motion and data at rest. So what we did with Xeno, we actually, um, you know, uh, reach from the experience that we had in, uh, in uh, data in motion protocol and leveraging much of the research that was done in Europe and US on what is called uh, name networking uh, protocol, name data networking protocol. We tried to come up with a problem that unifies the two and allows you with a unified set of abstraction to do very, very efficient data diffusion as well as distributed queries. 
So the protocol doesn't understand the, the query language, okay? But it uses um, an NTN way of naming data to route diffusion of data as well as to route queries and eventually consolidate queries across a routing network. The protocol is very time and space efficiency. When I mean very efficient, um, I'll, I'll jump to this slide. Um, whoops, um, it's like four byte overhead, okay? And when I say time efficient, um, as we want to use this protocol from tiny device up to the backbone, I mean, we can easily saturate 10 gigabit network, okay? Um, it supports uh, push as well as pull communication because you know, sometimes devices sleep and so they, they can't necessarily receive the data. And um, um, you know, it has been already at the foundation adopted by quite a few projects in uh, let's say 5G. And uh, if I can give you one example, one of the early use we had in 5G networks was precisely to allow base station not to have to send data to a cloud because there was too much data. And so they wanted to be able uh, to you know, diffuse data when it was necessary, but otherwise keep data locally and eventually uh, query data in a distributed manner with location transparency where that was relevant. So concluding, okay, so I think, uh, um, you know, Europe, um, and again, based on the presentation I heard this morning and uh, some, some other presentation at the workshop, I think as, uh, you know, the responsibility and the opportunity to really lead uh, in new technologies that really address the edge. And I think that there are a few initiatives uh, that uh, I hope you know, more people should be aware that are on the right track. And we should try really to create, um, you know, critical mass and join forces uh, for once, okay? <laughs> because we tend to be very fragmented in Europe um, to uh, try to really, I think, dominate uh, the edge. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much, too. Angelo. Uh, now I uh, quickly give the floor to the next speaker, that is Andrea Bartoli. Andrea? Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrea Bartoli. Uh, I will share my screen right now. Great. I think that you can see my screen. Still black. Yes. So yes. hold on. Here we go. Yes, you can. Ah, okay. It was charging. Sorry. So I will do it again. It was just a bit slow. Yeah. You can put now on full, yeah. Yeah, okay, so. Perfect. Um, thank you everybody for the invitation, for the organization and for the people that are attending and for all the experts that are presenting their technology or their, and their share their knowledge. So my presentation will be quite uh, shorter and very focused on, on business applications. So, uh, I have my past, uh, my, a little bit of background. Uh, I did my PhD on cybersecurity and I started working with Sensing Few uh, years ago. And now I'm the director of the business development department and uh, uh, we are mainly uh, focus our business on, on IoT. Uh, so maybe the most uh, valuable com uh, contribution that I can provide to all the audience is uh, a little bit our experience on this vertical and and on this market, uh, and um, especially uh, talking about real application that we are uh, deploying today uh, with our customer, and um, a little bit also uh, put on um, on ground uh, all the very nice uh, technical uh, explication of the several people have presented. So I agree with uh, uh, more of the of the topic that's been discussed. Uh, I also from a little bit innovation research background. So at the end, uh, what I see the big difference sometimes is uh, uh, on one level is the research and all the work done. And then when you go in the field and you want and the industrially things are working today, 100% uh, of, of, of reliability, uh, there are a, a little bit of gaps. So at the end, I want to share a little bit of our experience and how we are applying all these topics to, to our, with our customer. So a little bit of number. Well, Sensing uh, is, uh, as I said, an IoT company. We are uh, based on Barcelona. We are office uh, also in other country, Singapore, Los Angeles, etc. And uh, uh, a little bit of KPI, we are deploying and we are connecting today 150,000 sensors worldwide. Okay, so we are deploying and working on more than 60 countries. So we have a very big and extensive experience on several um, several uh, region and several certification and with, with several problems. So our main business is deploy our technology to digitalize and to connect 
physical critical infrastructure. So we talk about bridge, we talk about minings, we talk about construction project. So all these place where today or typically uh, all the work, the operation have been done from people going there and make a physical uh, measurement with, with typical instrumentation. Uh, we connect today and we provide a solution end to end in order to get this information in your office and take the season much more efficiently. Okay, so uh, a little bit of, 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 of uh, overview on the technology is working with LoRa One, so is uh, LP1 based. Uh, is uh, the main characteristic is the fact that is uh, battery power. So at the end, you use is, is try to be as much efficient as possible, uh, considering the energy consumption. So you deploy in the field is battery power again. You can connect a long list of geotechnical and structural sensor. Uh, you have your access point uh, deploy in the field with uh, a long range uh, um, connectivity. So you have your gateway, and over there is uh, our first level of edge uh, edge capability. And thanks to Ethernet connectivity, in, uh, uh, cellular connectivity, uh, different kind of possible interface, you finally reach uh, the cloud. So what, what was our experience? Uh, since uh, we were and we come from a very traditional um, uh, market, the first project where we deploy IoT, uh, I would say five years ago, all our customer, they didn't accept cloud at all. So everything was really close to the edge, local. They want the data in the gateway. Uh, they use uh, intranet to get the data from the gateway. And over there, they, con they connect maybe also with a PC and they have a lot of people working maybe also very simple with Excel, with, with uh, uh, basic stuff in order to get information, okay? So that was the first experience. What we are seeing in the last couple of years, the people really open and are much more interested in cloud. And the main reason behind is the cloud capability, the fact that uh, it's much more scalable, they can connect with other system. So they, they, they are currently in this process to understand and try to accept uh, the cloud capability. However, in parallel for us, this fact of interconnect and provide intelligence on the connection between cloud and edge is of course a very important uh, uh, pillar because we want to provide a, a, a added value and we want to provide a smarter product. So at the end, uh, even if uh, on the commercial side we are in this process to transfer the data to the cloud, on the other side we are working on a smart uh, uh, solution to to orchestrate the resources on the edge and the resources on the cloud. So uh, I, will, I will show you uh, an example, uh, which is a, a real case and what is working today. And I think that is very helpful for, for all the people, for the people that are attending this meeting to see, uh, no, which is a, a real application that is currently working on edge and cloud orchestration. So uh, let's say that uh, uh, we are working, as I said, in mining. In mining, there is one specific, very critical infrastructure that is called telling dams. Telling the tellings is all the material or all the, uh, I would say, uh, yes, working material after the process is planned. So the mining pro typical process is excavation. So you get the material, the rock, with also the raw material itself. You bring this material to the processing plant after the, the, the typical cleaning process, uh, you receive a kind of waste, okay? This waste in mining is called telling dams. And this waste normally are put in together and they create a kind of lake, okay? And this lake is calling telling dams, okay? So you can imagine in all, it's not happening always because sometimes these waste are rock, sometimes are sand, or sometimes are also material very liquid, okay? So in, 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 uh, in specific uh, mining processes plant or mining area, uh, there is these telling dams and it's very important to monitor this plant. So they create, the, the mining operator, I create uh, dams, but not by concrete, but by, with material, and, and, and then try to secure uh, these telling dams. So it's very important that these dams not fall down, of course. And until now, until the last, uh, we say, couple of years, all the operation uh, have been done uh, physically by people going there and monitor these dams. So you can imagine how critical this process could be and how dangerous. So it, it, you can start a little bit also in internet and you see that where uh, many incidents 
and also big incident. The last one, very important, was last year on February on Brumandinho in Brazil, where uh, hundreds of people die uh, due to uh, not good monitoring of distilling dams. So our experience was we digitalize this system right now. So we deploy our sensor. And as I said, the first application that they've been done traditionally is bring the data to the gateway over there, connect the gateway with a cable, with an ethernet to the control center. What we are working right now is to bring this data to the cloud, but what we are working is in a, in a risk management application where the sensor itself, so the, the, the deploy system itself smartly connective information and detect a potential incident without the need to send all the data to the cloud. So moving the application and the decision of, uh, uh, of sending information uh, when it's really necessary is a, is a key innovation for us and is what is bringing to, to the market everything was, was presented today. So it, it, of course, the first things that enter today as IoT is bring everything to the cloud, but this is not necessary at all. So the fact that you have more processing power in the device deployed, uh, Raspberry Pi, we have talked about many things, um, at the end give you the ability right now to work much more in the field to be able to smartly connect and collect information, identify a possible, a possible alert directly in the field and send information just when it is needed, okay? So this is a, a, an example of uh, where uh, all, everything was presented today is entering the market and what, this is what we are working on the mining sector. We have other example over here in the construction and we are working on similar risk management ap uh, application. At the end, when you do construction, uh, you create physical barrier. This is, for example, a tunnel construction project. You create uh, physical barrier uh, on the side in order to be able to make all your construction process. And over there, you have a long list of geotechnical sensor deployed that should be able uh, to give information about the stability of all the process during the construction activities. Uh, so instead to use manual uh, monitoring from people, we collect this in, uh, information through our de uh, dev devices and we send today everything in the cloud, uh, while in parallel we are working on smart algorithm uh, from the sensor and the IoT device itself, which should be able to detect this specific dangerous situation uh, in, in, before uh, they could happen and e even uh, without sending all the information to the cloud. And finally, we are also working railway. This is one, uh, the last vertical that we are, uh, let's say, digitalizing. Uh, and we see that we have very similar uh, activity. Of course, the sensor and, and the algorithm itself are very different each other because uh, in all this situation, uh, they have a specific uh, certification or specific uh, uh, algorithm that should be run in the sensor itself, but at the end, the logic is the similar. So uh, I just want to share with you the three different vertical where we are working and, uh, and making you just be aware that at the end, there is a transversality in the logic. However, since the vertical are very different each other and they need to comply with very different specific uh, uh, certification, the algorithm that should be run are very specific to, to, the, to the activity and the, to the application of the vertical. Okay, okay. so, yes. Uh, how long do you need to go? Because we are running yes. out of time. Two minutes. So Thank at you. the end, we have a cloud uh, application. Okay, so cloud architecture end to end with end device, uh, you have the access point and then you have the system in the cloud, you have the edge, uh, application what we are working here is how we can provide scalability and security in the same system so we are working to really create a risk management uh, optimization process where the data that are shared in the cloud is just uh, uh, what have to be shared without sensitive information sent to the cloud and uh, try to, to get out value as much as possible on, on the system that are deployed in the field thank you Thank you very much. Um, so I've seen several questions uh, being posted in the in the chat. I recommend you to do the same and to continue because since we're running a little bit out of time, uh, now I would like to pass to the next session. 
um, that is about discussions and future directions. We have four speakers here. We have Federico Faca from Martel Innovate. We have Ovidio Vermasan from Sintef. We have Ruta once again, Ruta Sofia from Fortis, and we have Paolo Zoni once again from Eurotech. Um, so um, I would like to ask all the speakers to switch on their video so we can see them. I am not sure whether you guys have slides for this uh, part of the agenda. Federico? I don't see Federico. Federico has slides there in the folder, Monique, I'll send it to you. I do have slides, sorry. I was uh, trying to start the, the camera. So, okay, so Federico is there. Federico, you have slides, you want to share them? Yeah, I will uh, Thank you. start quickly. Hope you can see them. Yes, we can. So, uh, inside the NGOT uh, project, we have been uh, uh, engaging different stakeholders and uh, analyze the uh, existing roadmap and, and try to come up with some uh, uh, perspective on uh, uh, future direction for IoT and, uh, and edge computing. Of course, this work will continue to evolve also uh, based on today discussion outcomes. Um, many of these uh, 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 items have been uh, already cited. Uh, I want just to highlight that uh, 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 really, the uh, uh, IoT is a unique case because in, in the technological landscape today, because it's really rely on a wide combination of, uh, of uh, technologies uh, spanning from the connectivity ones to the um, virtualization ones to the uh, more middleware and processing one, but also to um, more uh, uh, empiric uh, uh, sciences uh, like sociology and other more uh, related to application of law related to privacy and so on and uh, of course not to mention to forget the ethics aspect um, in relation to today uh, uh, discussion um, uh, we have uh, uh, I uh, highlighted in this set of uh, uh, priorities that are in the area of uh, uh, either economic and societal part or research and innovation and deployment, the ones that we think are uh, uh, really, really um, going to uh, be key for this uh, far edge uh, aspect. Um, on the societal and economical part, clearly, I mean, uh, uh, we are dealing with new technologies. Uh, and this means that uh, we need to ensure that people are available with the proper skill with, uh, to play with them. And this is also, uh, uh, of course, related to be sure that uh, in this phase of uh, uh, proliferation, uh, despite there won't be one uh, uh, standard uh, dominating all of them, uh, still there is ability to interoperate. And uh, of course, another important aspect uh, is that uh, the more you go uh, distribute, of course, the more uh, uh, taking uh, um, into account security and reliability becomes uh, uh, critical, but also complex. Um, in terms of technology, wide distribution of uh, uh, from the far edge to the cloud clearly implies doing things differently. Uh, we have uh, we have seen uh, some example also on the current work in this direction, for example, in the Eclipse Foundation and bring also means bringing the ability to take real time decision at the edge. And uh, this is really a, a, um, a also multifaceted uh, problem spun from low level layers of having uh, hardware uh, capable of uh, uh, supporting this decision making to proper uh, middleware and services on top. 
of course, also another key aspect is uh, the more wide and complex uh, your uh, network, even though you can uh, somehow uh, manage them across tires, the more uh, uh, um, it becomes complex to manage it. And this means that unless you introduce high degree of uh, automation, you will not be able to uh, comply with the task. And uh, yes, of course, uh, also increasing uh, uh, the number of uh, devices around requires more attention on the sustainability of these devices, but also uh, in the way uh, these devices are um, used and, and designed for the interaction with the human. And with this, I won't enter much more in detail and I leave uh, uh, the floor to other uh, uh, speakers today. And uh, I just uh, want to point that uh, uh, latest outcomes uh, of the project are available on the website. Thank you, Federico. Thanks very much. Uh, now the, the stage is uh, uh, for Ovidio. Ovidio, do you have slides? Will you be able to connect to audio, Ovidio? I saw that you were... Ovidio? I cannot hear Ovidio. Uh, I saw that he was trying... We can uh, jump to the next speaker. Hello, I just uh, joined. But I can. Great, we can hear you on video. Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so do you see my screen? Not uh, yet. We start seeing something. <laughs> uh, yes, we do. Yes. Very pinky and flashy uh, slide. <laughs> right, so uh, actually, uh, what I want to bring to the discussion today is the challenges for the future. So uh, we discuss a lot what we have today what uh, we are good at uh, and uh, for us it's very important to see how this uh, continuum in computing is transferred as well in continuum in research and innovation in the field of uh, uh, iot and edge computing so we cannot stop here we need to continue this uh, uh, fantastic uh, journey of research and innovation in the next uh, seven to ten years and we have many challenges in front of us and this starts uh, with the discussion that we had uh, today moving from centralized to decentralized and distributed and actually this is one of uh, the challenge of the next decade how to uh, implement technologies and uh, supporting tools for IoT and Edge to assure the full distributed uh, decentralized uh, solutions that will give us the possibility to move towards autonomy, to move uh, towards uh, uh, implementing uh, ways uh, and other ways of uh, intelligence applied to the things like, for example, swarm intelligence or collective intelligence for these uh, fixed and mobile uh, devices. So for this, I would say that for us, we are thinking of uh, several elements that we have today. We have the data centers, we have the cloud, we have the mini cloud and fog that uh, was uh, pushed by uh, uh, Cisco. Then we have the development of edge, the edge with different flavors, as I mentioned in different other uh, presentations. And we are moving more and more towards the uh, deep edge and extreme edge. Uh, and this uh, allows us actually in Europe to fill the gap that uh, we see in this area, edge, deep edge, extreme edge, and how we can uh, provide the technologies that will create a new paradigm for uh, um, autonomous, uh, systems developed based on uh, these technologies. And this brings uh, the issue of uh, convergence with other technologies because IoT and Edge will not work uh, uh, alone. We'll have a lot of uh, elements coming from uh, artificial intelligence and from uh, distributed ledger technologies and uh, digital twins. But at the same time, IoT, it's essential for the other technologies. 
without IoT and the data collected from the sensors uh, and um, the devices, IoT devices, AI technologies cannot develop further. They have started uh, based on the data that exists in the data centers, but now with the emergence of many uh, devices connected and interacting with one each other, the source for AI are the data or is the data from the uh, IoT devices. And then this brings as well the push from moving uh, the processing and the capabilities of creating applications from cloud to the edge. At the same time, moving and disrupting the value chains and the new type of uh, stakeholders will appear and will uh, monetize the data from uh, these applications. The next step that I would want to uh, point out is uh, that IoT and edge computing will bring some few elements or keywords that we see. Autonomous, it's one very important uh, element. Self-X, it's another one. And self-X, we understand self-organization, self-diagnostic, uh, self uh, uh, part of the identification and so on. Then we have the important element, dynamic. Nothing is static as before. We had the, before a very static uh, IoT application with a number of sensors placed, and then you collect uh, uh, through a central uh, uh, cloud all the information. But nothing is changing over a long period of time. This, uh, in the next period, will change. Then the neural topologies, some of the topologies that we will have in the in IoT application will be based as well on neural uh, topologies and neural architectures. The swarm intelligence will be more and more applied to different levels of edge computing and IoT applications because edge uh, and uh, swarm will uh, be integrated in application for IoT devices with different levels of the intelligence and uh, mobility. And this is a very important element. Then we will move towards uh, more and more identifying the senses of uh, IoT devices. So a new uh, capability for the uh, device that will bring new senses for the mobile uh, devices. This uh, uh, will create new challenges on collaborative work for IoT devices and service discovery. And as well, what uh, we see, uh, the IoT uh, and industrial IoT distributed intelligence will be uh, everywhere in these uh, IoT application uh, networks. Then I move on to the next point, which uh, is the move towards decentralized distributed architecture. Context aware, very important. Scalability, efficiency, adaptability, and transparency. These are keywords, the technology behind, we have to discuss in another context and much deeper. Then the enormous scale and the no enormous heterogeneity and the dynamic change. Again, very important features for the next uh, uh, challenges for IoT and edge computing. Then, as I mentioned, in many cases, the IoT and edge will evolve and will have different flavors and you will see this evolving in forms of internet of vehicles internet of robotic things internet of energy green internet of things internet of things senses uh, tactile internet of things and artificial intelligence of things these are all uh, concepts that in a way you will develop in uh, a way or another some of the features of the future uh, distributed uh, intelligence in the Internet of Things and uh, cloud uh, and the edge computing. Then I will jump just to uh, repeat the elements that we uh, identified from the previous uh, workshop that you organized and uh, from the meetings that we had with uh, the Alliance for Internet of Things Innovation. And uh, these are presented in these uh, six 
very short uh, messages. IoT and edge computing are the core of digitalization. And new IoT and edge computing capabilities drive the decentralization architectures and topologies. Edge computing has triggered and pushed uh, for a paradigm shift in the cloud computing. Orchestrating resources to form a computing continuum that we present, but you will see the computing continuum will be not anymore the one that is linear and centralized, will be the one that uh, starts to be uh, distributed and uh, decentralized, bringing disruptive changes in the supply chains. A new operating system, uh, system at the edge is necessary, and we have to strive for leadership in industrial IoT and edge computing, because industrial IoT will have a very uh, important uh, say in the future development in uh, the industrial landscape. And then we came up with uh, a number of recommendations. Europe must build on the, its strengths, and uh, based on its strengths, IoT and edge computing that support to accelerate the move towards digitalization and as well to further strengthen these uh, areas. There is a need for a market for IoT and edge computing that we have to uh, push to create it. You see some uh, are saying uh, when you want to see the future, you have to create it. And this is what we have to do uh, as well, this community. And the, the next uh, element is the trustworthy infrastructure for this new distributed architecture, which will be uh, totally different from the one that we have now, linear and uh, um, centralized. And uh, the stakeholders will be different. And Europe needs to capitalize on the shift of value creation to the edge where we'll bring new opportunities for many companies involved. I stop here, Monica. Thank you very much, Ovidio. <clears throat> A very dense um, chapter. Um, the, the slides will be made available, right, Ovidio? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So, because I think there's a few points that really deserve some, some further look into. And now uh, I will give the floor to Ruta and then uh, to Paolo. Okay, so Monica, I'd like to share the screen. Yeah, please go ahead. Ovidio, you should stop sharing your screen. Ovidio, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Now, Ute, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm just going to and I recommend to everyone to be as concise as possible because the time is really running after us. Okay, just opening right. a quick summary, okay? So in terms of, uh, so just a few points, in terms of research and development, so just a few points where I think it is also important to, to take a look that were discussed here today. So definitely the continuation, the follow-up of Edge Cloud Computing Continuum, uh, understanding, let's say, which technologies are helpful, which ones are missing, and also how to create new business opportunities. Then we also have, in terms of research and development, to look into the fact that there are new edges, new types of edges coming up. So again, not just our smartphones, which we have been using heavily in mobile crowd sensing, but actually the smart satellite constellations, they are already here with very low latency and uh, at least with, with some competitors uh, looking into new models of connectivity. So end to end again and point to point, so meaning connecting our end devices. So one question is how will these new connectivity models be handled in the current uh, technologies that we have and that are addressing in Europe? Then, of course, we have emerging technologies already recognized and which are being pushed such as, such as Edge AI, programmable hardware. But now we also have more advanced concepts, quantum computing, for instance, which may sound crazy, but has some interesting features. So we should also be looking into this from a research perspective. Uh, in the context of edge computing. And uh, another aspect is the evolution of the Internet of Things, which has so far on, on the last maybe 40 years been addressed as the Internet, of course, and an interconnection of objects. But right now it requires, as I think Frederick was saying, an interdisciplinary perspective because we have people and things. 
So the notion of thing is not just uh, this cyber physical system anymore. It's actually, it also integrates, let's say the actions, context awareness about the careers, the human careers and the human controllers, let's say. So then also some feedback in terms of uh, some uh, uh, tools, let's say that perhaps could can be interesting to, to to in terms of our R&D program. So on the one hand, there is an absolute must a need in getting in acquire in, in, in giving SMEs in particular skills and training in the new programmable hardware, open source models, licensing, and also certification processes. Uh, this is critical for the industry environment. Uh, in other words, these skills and training need to be done in a way that are understandable to new players. And we have that today, but still very fragmented. And perhaps it would also be interesting to actually, we have that already in the programs, but to actually some, somehow motivate, give incentives for the use of specific open source uh, platforms. In other words, try to create a strong uh, European open source uh, database. Um, and last but not least, so it's one of the things we are doing in IoT is actually to try to help and provide a global mapping and tooling to assist the different projects uh, in understanding which solutions are available today and which can be better for a specific uh, scenario. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, please, Paolo, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I have taken some notes during the workshop. Um, and uh, yeah, th th this today's will be focused more on technologies and although I have a t uh, an academic background, uh, I am from a company, so I see the reality of uh, IoT every day. Um, and I would like also to give voice to other aspects of IoT that probably today and tomorrow will not be considered and that uh, are fundamental for the uptake uh, of IoT, of the IoT market. We can discuss about technologies and technology is paramount for sure, but uh, the applicability, the acceptance of a solution is not just a matter of technology. And um, I have basically two main comments. Uh, the first one is related to the COVID uh, and more in general to crisis. IoT for sure will play an important role in monitoring, containing, treating, uh, uh, preventing and control future crises li like a pandemic. And paradoxically, a crisis represents a huge opportunity for, for IoT. Uh, on the other side, uh, uh, there is also a drawback. Probably crisis will also increase the digital divide because there will be um, stakeholders that will embrace completely the digital transformation while others will, uh, will, will, will remain reluctant to embrace it. And it will, this will create a lot of issues. But there is an important lesson that we have learned from the crisis, from, from, the, from COVID. Um, solving, uh, image, solving an immediate problem is not enough if uh, uh, the solution that we adopt uh, to solve this problem will not prevent the presence of this, pre of this problem in the future. And in, in, from this perspective, IoT is a great tool. It's a great solution to solve uh, um, this kind of problem forever. And the second comment is related uh, more in general to the adoption of IoT in the real world. Um, the acceptance of IoT and the adoption of IoT requires a change of perspective, uh, practically speaking. That is, em em embracing the digital transformation doesn't mean only to adopt the state of the art of technology. It, it's a strategic decision for a company and for the entire value chain. It's a change in the business approach. It's a change in, in, in perspective um, that involves many, many aspects that are not strictly related to technology. As I said before, uh, adopting IoT is something from, from a company perspective and specifically for the companies that are involved in vertical markets. It, it, it's, it, it's invasive, it's hard. Uh, this is a paradox, but this is the reality because you enter in their operational organizational processes that must be re completely reshaped uh, because they, they have to take advantage of the 
data of the information that are collected from the IoT. And this is something completely new for their, for their business. And uh, in parallel, they have also to adopt completely new business models. Uh, and they have to reshape also the financial aspects. Consider, for example, the payment mechanisms that uh, must be completely new with IoT technologies. Um, the, the, the process of digitalization transform also the role and the positioning of the company in the value chain. And this is another important change in the life of a company that is involved uh, in an IoT driven market. Uh, it changes also the relation that the company has with other stakeholders, the partnership, the alliances with other stakeholders. And this is another huge change for a company. Um, then, uh, it, it has already been said a couple of times, the digital transformation requires also new skills, new expertise, that very, very frequently the companies, the stakeholders involved in the verticals uh, have not in the, in the organization. And very frequently, this kind of uh, figures are not available also on the market. So uh, we need to invest a lot in education and professional training. That is another fundamental aspect. Um, I already anticipated in the previous discussion, adopting IoT is a cultural change, um, a shift uh, um, towards flexibility, uh, toward a more service-oriented approach, both in from a technical perspective and from a business perspective. Uh, it, it affects all the part of this organization from uh, IT to operation, to management, to manufacturing, uh, sales, and so on and so forth. So it's something that uh, is really intrusive. And um, th these are whole aspects that I would like, that I wanted to bring also to your attention, because as I said at the beginning, it's not just a matter of technology. Technology is paramount, uh, but uh, uh, when you have to do sales in IoT, you have also to consider these complementary aspects. Thank you very much, Paolo. I think, um, um, well, I, I'm pretty glad that you were the fourth because you have basically summarized a lot of uh, the points that uh, I wanted to actually bring up in this uh, closing part of the session, in which I will give the, the floor uh, to um, Rolf um, uh, on behalf of the Commission, to Martin on behalf of UIOT, and to Jean-Luc on behalf of Artemis IA. Let me um, anticipate uh, one important point. Uh, there was a lot of uh, information. Um, as we said, this uh, session has been recorded. We have the slides that will be made available. And we also have all the questions of the audience that are uh, for us very important, you know, uh, food for thought because uh, as a community and as uh, uh, coordinators within the um, NGIOT community. We want to make sure that um, there is a, a way to follow up on the discussions. Now, um, I like very much what Paolo said, adopting IoT, it's, it's a cultural change. So um, today we didn't have time to, to touch so much on aspects which concern ethical issues, legal aspects, but also uh, social um, implications of developing more and more technologies that are embedded with our everyday life. And what is clear is that uh, Europe uh, has a big opportunity here. There's a lot of work to be done, but there's also a lot of top players in Europe on the research, on the innovation, and on the uh, service and technology um, supply and demand side, both on the public and, and, and private sides. And uh, now um, our three uh, last speakers will try to uh, draw the lines uh, for concluding this event. Tomorrow, um, 9.30 to 12.30, there's gonna be a se second session. The same link, the same Zoom uh, uh, connection will work for this uh, session. Um, I would like in, an, in advance to, to thank all of you for participation. Now uh, the floor goes to uh, Rolf, uh, Martin, and um, Jean-Luc. If you can switch on your video so people can also see you. 
So I, I think actually Max is here. Uh, ah, okay, great. Perhaps we should give uh, Max the opportunity. Absolutely. I didn't see him any longer, so. He's here on a, under an uh, mm -hmm. uh, interesting must... acronym. Yeah, Lem Kema. Yeah, this is my login, so I'm sorry for that. Okay. No, I was here all the meeting, except for in the break. I took a break in the break. So uh, I think for me, this was very, very interesting. It showed very much, I think, where we, where we need to go. I think we need to compile that now and discuss further. I'm also looking forward to hearing a bit tomorrow when it in particular is also about open source and so on. I would not repeat now what I've said in the beginning. I think a lot went into that direction in a bit, with a bit broader scope. So thank you very much. But I would like to give the opportunity still to Rolf to, to complement this quickly, what I have said, because I had the opening already this morning. So Rolf, please. Yes, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm sorry for, I had problem with my PC, which my auto crashed, so and, and, and the, uh, the link was broken. So thanks again for the interesting day. Um, I think um, it was inspiring. Many of the presentations were to the point. Uh, I think it's another break in our discussion. We know where where IoT, IoT is going. Uh, I acknowledge particularly um, that the event was co-organized with um, um, representatives from, from Artemis. Um, essentially, um, we've seen that Artemis as an association and it, which plays a key role in the JU or key digital technologies as well, um, is um, very much in favor of supporting IoT and the challenges of IoT. I think we recognize many of the challenges. Um, this said, um, I think we were about, we had about uh, more than six years of what we call an IoT focus area, where we've seen a lot of challenges or solutions. So today um, we, we have seen repeating a lot of challenges um, but the, the work, you know, is not stopping. The work is continuing. We've seen uh, that many of the international big players, what we call hyperscalers, also recognize the challenges and the opportunities of IoT. Uh, at the same time, what you phrase today is there's a strong need to focus on the challenges, but not to do the long to work in partnerships uh, and to, to join forces. Um, we see that today um, that IoT is has a, a strong role in the cloud to play because much of the IoT data is moved to the cloud, and meaning that we have the cloud, the power of the cloud in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, computing, uh, data storage, um, and data processing. So I think uh, we recognize today there's an opportunity for European players um, to join forces uh, and to regain um, also momentum in the data economy if data is stored or is processed at the edge, I think that this is and recognized. Uh, what is still open, you know, to what extent we can embrace the European strength um, in computing and sensing in electronic control systems and systems of systems? Um, what are the initiatives to bring together in order to make that partnership movement or the collaboration happening in Europe? Uh, but also what is the, the need for SMEs to participate? Uh, we heard about open, um, architectures, open solutions, the need for skills. Uh, eventually, we've seen the opportunity for open source. So I think that brings me to the point that we have another day tomorrow um, where we will address the, the industry needs, but also the um, opportunities for open source, which we partly heard today. And, and then that may be an advertiser for tomorrow. Tomorrow, the day is co-organized with Eclipse, and I'm pretty much looking forward to tomorrow's discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, Jean-Luc. Yes, Jean -Luc, I'm you? here. <laughs> I need to wear this because it's the rule in the office. Okay, that's not a, a problem. Jean-Luc, just if you wanted to say a couple of words in uh, um, closing this event and then Martin will wrap up. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think it was a, a great event and a great uh, opportunity. I first want to thank uh, yourself and uh, the European Commission for organizing it. I think it's uh, a very important uh, first path. 
Second, I want to thank my members, um, which have, uh, I would say, rightly promoted uh, IoT and edge computing, and also who have given uh, some very good, I would say, pieces of challenges. Uh, in a wrap up, what I would say is that it's very important that we devote uh, clearly some uh, collaborative research and meaning for the entities, whether they are public or private. It means funding, clearly funding from coming from Europe. But I think exactly like uh, Patrick and Paolo insisted, uh, it's extremely important that we work in a value network and that we understand where the money is going, particularly for the right fights. Uh, we cannot uh, cascade and we shall not only keep in mind the bottom-up approach that has been for too many years, the approach of the digital. We really need to bring a bit of top-down and around the side value network, that is to say, the little money that Europe can bring compared to what is happening in Asia and in America should be brought on the right projects where in IoT, in system of systems, in edge computing, Europe can make a difference, not in semi-lost battles where it's completely impossible to uh, gain or to put ourselves in competition. We need to accept what we need to fight for. One important element that was mentioned by many uh, contributors and including uh, my members was indeed to link also uh, these topics to their carbon neutrality impact. That is where clearly Europe is making a big difference because whether extremely mega private owned companies coming from the US and state owned companies or at least state influenced companies in Asia, such as in China, are not as I would say advanced in the obsession to be carbon neutral as Europe is. We need to take advantage. It's not so much to speak about the Green Deal as a flag up, is really to make each of the value networks entity actors of carbon neutrality in the scope. Because this is where we can make difference, where we should bring also some smartness in the barriers. That is to say that exactly as we are defending on physical products that won't match environmental and GDPR status coming from outside of our continent, we should be smart to think ahead on some smart barriers when we will have to include some other technologies that are not carbon neutral oriented. So this, I think, it is a big, big interesting aspects that Europe needs to lead because there is a potential leadership on that axis. But it means that it's not the business as usual people that should think and bring those ahead. It means that these IoT and system of systems issues should be very much revised at the top level and at the strategy, at the corporate strategy of the different companies. As we all know, all the companies are during these years because of taxonomy, because of many important regulatory um, issues are rethinking their strategy and the digital is no exception versus any other kind of economic activity so it's extremely important that we seize this challenge and turn it into an opportunity where i think that europe in this case can still bring a certain leadership for the world and i stop here and i thank you very much can i make one comment uh, monique Sure, please go ahead, Max. 
I, I just have one comment. I, I enjoyed very much what you said, Jean-Luc, in particular that we should not only be bottom up, but be top down and see where to put the money and put them in the right projects. And I think we have to reinforce that and, and think what we do. So I very much appreciate that comment. It helps us and we have to find a way how to do it. Second, I also like very much your link to the twin transition. So, you know, the overall European policy is digital and sustainable. So this, this merging them, and I've always told people who are working on the Green Deal that we have to make the Green Deal and bring the Green Deal forward, but not forget competitiveness of European industry. So it's a, it's a joint effort. They can only go together. If we are not competitive, we cannot afford the Green Deal in future. So I think the IoT and what we have discussed today is a very good way to bring these things together. So just as a feedback to you directly, I appreciate very much what you said. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to everybody for this event, by the way. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Martin, do you want to add anything? It's very difficult to add anything that hasn't been said. Uh, yes, uh, I, I sit back with one thought. I mean, basically what we are seeing with this far edge is the data comes in implicitly with intelligence. What does this mean? It means that instead of having the, 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 the normal uh, and comfortable von Neumann set up where we can separate operations from data, what we're having in fact is that no, we have to anticipate, we have to assume intelligence. And this has vast ramifications for our architectures. I think Dr. Ferrari uh, made exactly this point, And we saw many uh, who gave variations on how we are going to in fact use this to face our societal challenges. So uh, all uh, left here being the far edge of the knowledge today, tomorrow we uh, scope more into how we will actually do this together, how we mobilize with the instruments we are seeing around. So um, thank you, Max. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, thank you, Jean-Luc. It was a pleasure to do this together with you and Artemisia. Uh, we look forward to uh, tomorrow um, with the Eclipse colleagues and the Alliance for Innovation. Monique, thank you for taking us through this day. A big hand to you. Thank you very much. Uh, just that you know, all we will put online the slides on the ngiot.eu portal, so stay tuned. And of course, don't miss uh, tomorrow's discussion because we will continue. Thanks a lot and have a good afternoon.